Hello everybody and welcome to episode 266 of the Dry Dock. This is the first episode after I got back from the United States in September. So buckle in, there's going to be a lot of questions. Let's see what they are. Cisco Fan asks, how were the South Carolinas and other early American dreadnoughts able to get away with all centerline turrets and triple expansion engines, considering even the British with turbines had wing turrets on dreadnought herself and the St. Vincent and Bellerophon classes. So this comes down to design choices and options in the two navies. On the one hand, when you're looking at the US ships, they do have an advantage, which is that for the first three classes of ships, the British dreadnoughts don't actually have super firing turrets, as in one stacked above the other. If you look at dreadnought Bellerophon and St. Vincent, which are all kind of derivatives of dreadnought, the three centerline turrets are all flat, almost you know Russian Gangut style, and then you have the two wing turrets. Whereas if you look at the South Carolinas, they have four super super firing turrets in two super firing pairs. That obviously means that the magazines etc take up a little bit less space because they're nice and crowded together, and particularly leaves a lot more room on the center line. And then for the South Carolinas, when you combine that with the fact that they're only going at 18 knots, so therefore they'd need less power in the first place, you're able to fit the four turrets on the South Carolinas plus the vertical triple expansion engines, essentially you know trading up a bit more space and trading down on the speed. The reason that British ships tend not to have this kind of layout early on and even a little bit later that have some limitations on dead ahead and dead astern firing is because they persist with sighting hoods mounted on the turret roofs or rather through the turret roofs uh, which make firing guns straight over the other lower turret a little bit of a painful experience for those in the lower turret. With the Delawares and the Floridas though it's a slightly different story. They have a somewhat questionable design decision going on which is essentially that they ran out of space and they decided screw it we're doing this anyway now obviously of those four ships the two delawares and two floridas not all of them had vertical triple expansion engines but nonetheless what they ended up doing is they actually put the engines in between the turrets so for example you can see this example of that particular variant of ship you've got some very close spaced funnels between turret 2 and turret 3 as is american nomenclature that is obviously where the boilers are and when you look at this you think well hang on there's not a lot of space between uh, turret 3 and the aft funnel and the, the engines can't possibly be in that little space that's where the second cage mast is and you'd be right, they're not. Uh, the second ca cage mast is just covering over a little bit of the boiler room. And then the engines are actually positioned between turrets 3 and 4. So you've got the raised turret of turret 3, then a long space because turret 4 faces turret 3 and the barrels cannot touch. And that's where the engines are. So essentially they've... Uh, moved the engines to mingle in with the main armament and that's how they managed to fit all the machinery in there uh, I, although again you've got some space saving because turrets one and two are super firing but if you've ever wondered why the second and third classes of american dreadnoughts have this slightly odd layout you know why don't they just take turret four and make it super firing well make turret three super firing over turret four and then bring turret five back roughly to the position that turret four occupies at the moment and this is why <laughs> um, now this does allow you to have your five turrets with 10 guns all on the center line even if you are using vertical triple expansion engines and of course as technology was advancing the triple expansion engines were taking up slightly less space but it did have quite a number of drawbacks uh, for one thing <laughs> as you can see once you take into account the magazines, this ship is 70 to 80 percent citadel space by length. There are very few places on this ship that you can hit which aren't going to be critical damage, which of course means your armor belt is going to have to be quite long. But also, and this is something I've mentioned in previous dry docks, 
you have to run your high temperature, high pressure steam lines from your boilers to your engines, and that means they have to go past the magazine of, in this case, turret three. That makes it, with the refrigeration technology of the time, impossible to keep the temperature of the magazine down to the same level that it is in the fore and aft turrets. And that means that you're gonna have a somewhat inaccurate set of salvo firing because the temperature of the propellants before they are detonated is going to be different for the guns of turret three compared to the other four turrets. And that in turn affects both the rate of generation and total amount of energy that you're gonna get out of those guns. So it's kind of a solution, but it's not a particularly brilliant one in terms of get making your guns actually shoot straight. Jellico Cats asks, in the movie Flight of the Intruder, in response to some unauthorized hijinks, Commander Caparelli issues the following threat. I will have you keelhauled, and that's serious on an aircraft carrier. How common a practice was keelhauling, and when was the last time some unfortunate sailor was keelhauled? So keelhauling, for those of you who aren't aware, involves tying a sailor to a rope that is fed, or has already been fed, under the ship and then you haul them via that rope under the vessel. This can either be from side to side or from bow to stern. It's a pretty vicious and nasty method of punishment because of course, especially back in the age of sail, a ship's underside in anything other than a fresh out of port situation is going to be covered in barnacles and other forms of sea growth which means that at the very minimum, if you're keelhauled, you know, a day after the ship's left port, you're going to be bumped or smashed, depending on how quickly you're being hauled through the water, repeatedly into the underside of the ship. And, you know, you probably want to be hauled fairly quickly because otherwise you'll drown. And if you are unlucky and you keel keelhauled any time pretty much thereafter, you're going to be cut to pieces by all of the sharp shells and other things that are stuck to the underside of the ship as well as being bashed into it. Now it's something more of a performative method of punishment, uh, more for show and discouragement than a regular one. It's not very common and its practice is a little bit hard to determine according to various sources, but it, it seems to have been in use at points by almost every major age of sail navy but it dies out as a form of punishment relatively quickly um, so you know even by the early 1700s most major navies have stopped the practice if they ever really did it you know because there is a difference with some of these real extreme punishments between having it on the books and actually doing it and then by the mid 1700s, pretty much everybody had stopped. Now, when, when you look at the few recorded instances of keel hauling that are actually verified as having occurred, they tend to be more of the side to side method. So you're lowered off the port side of the ship and hauled around to the starboard side, albeit they sometimes tend to do this quite a few times, giving you a little break in between so you don't die which will make it incredibly painful and prolonged of an experience because, as I said, if they did it bow to stern, there's a chance you could just die from injury and blood loss, but there is a much, 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 much higher chance considering that you're talking about ships, especially by the early 1700s, that are going to be you know 180 to 250 foot long, that in the time it takes them to haul you that distance, you may very well have drowned. And so... Officially, the last time any major Age of Sail Navy keeled hauled someone was somewhere in the mid-1700s. There are reports in the 19th century in some other navies across the world of keel hauling occurring on occasion, but those are somewhat more scattered. So, tentatively, I would say probably the last person that was keel hauled was some point late in the 19th century. And in terms of the quote from Flight of the Intruder, yes, if you were keel hauled on an aircraft carrier, you almost certainly would die. And this also factors into getting an idea of just how large ships have become. If you take a large aircraft carrier, such as a Queen Elizabeth class, or, you know, even worse, a Nimitz or a Ford class, and you look at the distance 
across ways. You could take a first rate ship of the line like HMS Victory, and you could put HMS Victory perpendicular to Queen Elizabeth, Nimitz, or Ford on the flight deck. And if you had Victory's stern on, say, the port side of the flight deck, Victory's bow would not reach to the starboard side of the flight deck. Now, obviously, the flight deck is somewhat wider than the actual beam of the ship in underwater. Uh, but still, given that sailors would typically run from port to starboard on the much, much smaller, more typical frigates and third rates, and HMS Victory is a relatively large first rate, if you were keel hauled on an aircraft carrier, if you were then hauled, you know, 110, 120, 160 feet underwater, obviously depending how deep you had to go, as well as the absolute width, chances are you're going to drown because if and if they haul you through fast enough that you're not going to drown, you're probably going to be hit hitting the hull hard enough to probably break your neck anyway. And if they keel haul you from stem to stern. On an aircraft carrier, I doubt you'd even have reached amidships by the time you've run out of air. John M. asks, In 1954, the Gregory Peck movie Horatio Hornblower has a battle between HMS Lydia and Nativada. Was the rigging and the combat tactics shown based on what ships in the Age of Sail could do? And are the scenes showing Hornblower destroying a squadron at anchor in harbour based on how such actions would have un been undertaken? Overall, uh, the rigging on the ship shown is actually pretty realistic. I mean, obviously, they're not actually taking a frigate and a small ship of the line and having them blast the living daylights out of each other. So there are slightly fewer ropes present or lines present than you would find on a full-scale ship of the line. I mean, just go and look at USS Constitution nowadays, or the French Hermione, or even the, the Gilland over in Scandinavia. And you'll see there are a few additional rigging ropes, but they've done a pretty good job, actually, of representing the full rigging of these kinds of ships. So you might as well actually call it pretty much accurate. Similarly with the combat tactics, the combat tactics in the Lydia versus Nativada engagement are near enough spot on. I mean, the idea of taking on a larger ship of the line on the side where the wind has blown the ship over so it can't really use its lower gun ports, that is actually taken exactly out of the playbook of the Royal Navy when Indefatigable and Amazon in, engaged the Duat de l'Homme. That is exactly the tactic they used, uh, so that the French ship of the line couldn't use its lower gun deck, which was, of course, also the heaviest gun deck. Now, of course, the manoeuvres, as shown on in the film, take place at a little bit of accelerated speed compared to what they would in real life, because, hey, it's a movie we don't have time to make the entire movie about just the gunfight. But in general you know the the tactics and the maneuvers are accurate as i said even if they are a little bit sped up also the amount of damage and how the damage occurs are also, is also pretty spot on they did a very good job of all of that now obviously there are a few minor issues watching that i did have to laugh at you know hornblower's absolutely terrible british accent you know there's a bunch of people in the crew with perfectly fine british accents and then you have Hornblower occasionally trying and then slipping back into stereotypical American um, at various points. And then I think halfway through the battle just abandons all pretense at being British at all. And of course, uh, the Spanish or ex-Spanish ship at that point seems to be crewed by a bunch of people who have escaped from a Speedy Gonzales live action remake. But never mind. Um, as far as... Hornblower destroying the squadron anchor later on with HMS Sutherland. Those particular tactics and actions are not representative of how you usually do it in the Age of Sail. Pretty much for the reasons that you see in the movie. Um, if you were to take a ship of the line, even one with shallow draft, into a harbour to engage a bunch of other ships of the line, well, one, you, assuming those ships are manned, you're going to be horribly outgunned. Uh, for two you are not going to be able to shoot accurately enough from a single ship of the line to dismast four before they return the favour, long before they return the favour. Um, and three, 
yeah, the, the forts and the coastal guns will have something to say about it. Now, the idea of a single ship sitting outside of a harbour finding a bunch of enemy ships aligned and deciding they're going to do something about it, the Royal Navy did enact those kind of operations relatively frequently, but usually what they would do is called cutting out operations. So you either sneak in at night and literally steal one of the enemy ships, and you usually don't use your ship, you usually use a bunch of men in boats because they're more sneaky, and if they're caught it's less of a loss to the ship, or you just set fire to them. So with the loss of the Sutherland later on, you know, that's exactly why you don't do it that way. Classe Cornate asks, at what point in time did sub-spam become a viable way of eliminating an enemy fleet? Well, I think for the time period that the channel covers, assuming that the two fleets in question are, well, not necessarily equal, but at least roughly within shouting distance of each other, i.e., you know, one fleet isn't so absurdly large that they can pretty much guarantee roll over the other fleet in a day or two if the two decide to actually slug it out. I don't think in the period of the time channel cut that the time that the channel covers sub spam is a viable way of eliminating an enemy fleet. Now against an island nation you can perhaps eliminate the enemy nation as a whole by submarine blockade, but actually taking out the enemy fleet the problem is that by the time submarines are introduced obviously ships are vulnerable to torpedoes they don't have torpedo defenses and indeed until you get into you know substantially into world war one if a submarine is submerged there's precious little you can actually do about it but during that period up to the mid 1910s submarines are also fairly basic in terms of their capabilities they're not very fast they're not don't have particularly long endurance they don't carry large numbers of torpedoes etc so whilst in theory if you took you know any one of the french german or russian navies and they said okay well instead of building battleships and cruisers and destroyers they're just going to build entirely submarines then sure if you put any one of those against any one of the others then perhaps by throwing hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of submarines at your opponent you might be able to take out their fleet but their fleet might also just escape by being slightly further away <laughs> and you know with france germany and russia the reason i chose them is because in the early part of the submarine period 1890s early 1900s their fleet sizes are within shouting distance of each other whereas in that time period if you say took america versus japan or any of the three we mentioned against america or japan sub spam isn't going to work because but well, the enemy fleet's an ocean or two away and the submarines just can't reach that far then as you go through the late 1910s into the 20s 30s 40s Submarines become significantly more capable, but the ability to meaningfully fight them underwater also advances. At which point, again, assuming that the industrial bases are you know within similar orders of magnitude, you're probably going to end up losing submarines eventually at a higher rate than the you can inflict losses on the enemy. Because, of course, once again, while submarines do have stealth, once an engagement begins and with things like sonar and hydrophones it becomes more likely that that will happen any damage to a sub is at least a mission kill if not an actual kill whereas surface ships can take considerably more damage and still remain operational and are a little bit easier to fix so whilst subs are lethal enough to blockade a nation that relies on overseas trade they're not lethal enough to engage and destroy an enemy fleet again assuming the fleets are you know within shouting distance of each other it is possible during this time period to wipe out an enemy fleet with a mass fleet of submarines but the number of subs you'd need to do that would indicate that the disparity is so large you could have done that with a surface fleet anyway how that advances now a days with nuclear powered submarines and everything it's beyond the period of the 
time channel the channel covers so who knows maybe these days if somebody just spammed out nuclear attack subs instead of service vessels they'd be able to take out an enemy war fleet but no one's tried that as far as i'm aware ferris asks hearkening back to your review of the world's worst warships for some ships that are legitimately bad like rougeau for example what are some of the design choices that you would make to alleviate their flaws and how do you think that would affect the rest of that navy's subsequent development the problem with a lot of ship designs when they are just legitimately actually terrible as opposed to just not particularly efficient is that there are usually very few things you can actually do to significantly alleviate the problems with them because for a ship to be legitimately terrible it usually means that the entire design concept they've been built with is completely fundamentally flawed so there isn't really any rescuing it and this is kind of you know what separates some ships that are usually categorized in as terrible designs so for example as you all know by now i don't think bismarck is a very efficient design but it's not a terrible design at its core it's a large battleship that goes relatively quickly and as you saw with my redesign video there are ways that you could fix it within a reasonable degree of plausibility of course if the more and more implausible you go there are even better things you can do with it but there are other ships like let's say ruggio where it's just a, a bad job from the start what can you do with ruggio yes you could make things slightly differently so that she becomes an effective carrier but the things you would have to do would essentially make her not even anything close to what ruggio was at which point you're not um, you're not mitigating or alleviating the ship's flaws you are just making a brand new ship so taking ruggio as an example sub 10,000 ton carrier trying to get her to go really fast and initially designed as a treaty breaker and as it turns out you you just can't do that whilst also having the ship as an effective strike carrier about the only thing you could really do with Ruggio once the concept is embedded would be perhaps to completely eliminate all strike aircraft so dive bombers and torpedo bombers from her design and make her purely maybe a scouting support vessel now that's an idea i've mentioned a few times before in various contexts but you know if you are going to be stuck with something or like ruggio especially given japanese navy doctrine at the time then perhaps what you should do is stick half a dozen long-range scout aircraft on her maybe even a dozen and fill up all the available remaining space with fighter aircraft and then her role would become not as a fleet carrier but as a ship that just stays with the rest of the carriers and her role is purely to support a reasonably large recon wing to go and find things for the other carriers to attack and to provide a reasonable amount of fighters perhaps to cover the ships with a combat air patrol so if Ruggio becomes your dedicated combat air patrol vessel that means more fighters from the other carriers can be diverted off to escort your strike packages rather than having to remain home and operate a cap there from them but with a lot of the other ships um, the full question mentions things like the Condottieri class and the Omahas you basically have to as I said, either change the parameters the ship's designed for or radically alter at least one of the ship's design ideas, which usually comes down to sacrificing the parameters of the mission it's designed for in order to facilitate a decent enough change. So, for example, with the Omahas, yeah, you could have all the guns in turrets instead of casements, but to do that you're going to need more space, and for that you're going to need to downrate the ship's speed, and for that you need to sacrifice the idea that the US Navy had in the late 1910s and early 20s of an all-35 knot fast fleet screen. Kevin Weber asks... Jack Eusen, a survivor of the Samuel B. Roberts, stated that whilst they were in the water, a Japanese cruiser approached as if to run them over, but veered off at the last minute and the Japanese captain could clearly be seen saluting them. 
Interestingly, a survivor of the Johnston told of an almost identical encounter, but with a destroyer. Was this extremely rare, or did these types of occurrences happen more frequently than we might think? And also, was there anything in the Central Force leadership chain that would give clues about what drove this epidemic of chivalry? Or was it just the perfect timing of ships being ordered north just at that moment? As to the specific particulars of the Centre Four ships and the sailors of Johnston and Roberts, I don't think I'd want to make specific comment on those incidents as I don't think I know enough about the precise details as and you know what the Japanese officers in question might have been thinking in that particular case however shedding light on that incident and in more general cases across the, the globe not just World War One but elsewhere you do have a much greater concept in naval combat of what some people term the brotherhood of the sea which essentially comes down to the fact that you fight your opponent but once your opponent's ship has been defeated you then show respect to your enemy and if possible do everything in your power to save them uh, usually because you know the sea is an extremely hostile environment and there's a certain amount of you know there but for the grace of god go i uh, that most sailors have in mind plus of course you know it's somewhat reciprocal if your ship gets sunk and you get picked up by the enemy there's a reasonable chance that if one of the enemy ships gets sunk, your side might be more inclined to pick up their survivors. So, you know, there's a bit of self-interest going on there as well. There's also the threat level. You know, if you are, let's say, you uh, stick with the example of World War II, if you're fighting on land and the enemy is defeated and you're overrunning their position, a soldier, if they're still alive even if they're downed, could still be a threat. You know, they could be concealing a grenade. They could have a gun or something hidden away. There is a risk they may not surrender, and they might be concealing some kind of trap, etc., etc. And even in the air, if an aircraft falls out of the air with something trailing from it, it might be a decoy. Um, there might be other aircraft waiting to pounce on you if you try and follow them down and finish them off if it's a bomber going down um, you might still be fired at by the various gunners etc so even a down and out enemy at least something that appears to be down and out to you might still be a threat at sea however if you look around and you see right well either there aren't any other enemy ships in the vicinity or the ones that are a long way away and can't hurt us and the ship that's much closer at hand either is in the process of sinking or has been sunk there is nothing the survivors in the water can really do to threaten you, you know, the disproportionality of force is completely uh, out of whack what was a threat to you was the enemy ship you know, a couple of dozen, a couple of hundred guys in the water, they they literally can't even clog your propellers. And if there's not a threat, then you don't have to treat them as a threat, at which point they become people in the water, at which point, you know, things revert, as I said earlier, to, well, we might, might as well save them. Then you've got the fact that presumably these people fought valiantly before going down, so you want to acknowledge that as well. And this all bleeds together into this culture of ships at sea will either help or if they can't help because they're in the middle of still in the middle of active combat or chasing down an enemy they will at least acknowledge and respect people wherever they can and even in the imperial japanese navy a decent commander is still going to do that now of course that doesn't mean especially with the japanese navy in world war ii that there weren't incidences where crews acted very very differently um, you have multiple reports of japanese navy ships machine gunning survivors of the enemy ships in the water uh, which is obviously a war crime but the fact that people make such a big deal out of the instances in the, where the japanese navy did this kind of proves the point that it's exceptionally unusual 
for that kind of thing to happen. And even amongst the Japanese Navy, that wasn't a universal thing. Lou is British for John asks, The Dutch submarines sound like they were built by British Leyland. What was the reliability of each major submarine force? Whilst it's true the Dutch subs in the East Indies did have a little more than their fair share of mechanical issues, you do have to bear in mind a few factors that mitigate that somewhat. The ones that had the worst mechanical issues were very old subs and were usually on the list for disposal at that point. Plus, at least for, you know, when you consider for the Dutch, they have spent the most, most recent period just before the outbreak of war with the Japanese as kind of the last outpost of free Dutch territory because their homeland's been overrun by the Germans, which does make getting spare parts a little bit difficult because Nazi Germany was not really in the habit of exporting spare Dutch submarine parts to what was left of the Dutch Navy, which is going to obviously exacerbate the regular maintenance of the subs in question. Plus, as any sailor who's deployed to the Southwest Pacific will tell you, the humidity and general environment of the Southwest Pacific is one of the things that could be counted as a hostile work environment for a lot of ships. So vessels operating in that area will tend towards somewhat greater rates of mechanical breakdown than in more temperate waters. The newer Dutch submarines are somewhat more reliable which is why you know in the account even covering those few months you don't have quite so many mechanical issues with the newer vessels but the older ones have enough of a laundry list of problems to make up for that now as far as reliability of each major submarine force i don't think you can really characterize reliability at least in world war ii of any nation submarine fleet as a whole because there are some very reliable subs out there and there are some incredibly unreliable subs out there in each navy's fleet so for example the early u.s attempts at fleet submarines something like a sargo class horrifically unreliable um, thanks in large part to their engines but once you get to the gatos and balaos very reliable almost to a degree regardless of where you base them from although of course the supply of spare parts at forward bases is going to be somewhat less than the supply of spare parts especially the really big ones if something big gets broken that further back at places like pearl harbor or san diego and likewise you know the british the japanese the italians they all have their own fair share of older subs or classes that launched with issues and their share of newer subs and subs that are generally very reliable because the design just worked about the only navy that has a large submarine fleet that probably could be analyzed in overall terms would be the kriegsmarine and that's largely because they have a negligible amount of smaller older subs I mean the Type 7s are quite small but thanks to Germany starting up its sub fleet building efforts somewhat later than everybody else thanks to the Versailles Treaty etc the vast majority of Germany's submarine fleet is made up of newer designs but without the albatross around their neck of the older vessels their overall reliability rate is going to apparently increase so yeah, I, I think it's better to talk about the reliability rates of specific classes of submarines that made up significant portions of each navy than it is about a submarine fleet's overall reliability rates, but that would be a subject for a Wednesday video. Silder on Machine Works asks, You've often mentioned how the German and Italian naval operations were hampered by a lack of oil. Germany developed a process to create synthetic petroleum from coal, Suppose they got it working on a large scale and used the coal reserves of Germany and their captured territories to provide the Kriegsmarine with all the fuel that, and diesel that they wanted. Let's say they were also giving the Regia Mariner all the fuel that they wanted. What do you suppose the two navies would have done and would it have made much of a difference in the face of the Royal Navy and later the US Navy? 
So firstly, the Germans did get their synthetic fuel production going at a fairly large scale. Um, a very large chunk of all the fuel that the German armed forces used during World War II was made artificially. And this is kind of the issue because it's not a problem of whether or not the process works, it's a problem of just sheer scale. So to give you some idea of the difference in scale that we're looking at compared to land or air warfare, to fill the tanks of Tirpitz fully, so that's all the extra tanks, etc., designed for long-range cruising, that requires as much fuel as you'd need to fill the tanks of roughly 12,000 Messerschmitt 109s or approximately 6,000 Tigers. Now, of course, the Germans never built 6,000 Tigers, which means you're actually looking at being able to top up the fuel tanks of every single Tiger ever produced uh, for quite a number of full-run missions. Basically, fill every single Tiger tank ever built five times over. Now, that means that there's, a, there's an awful lot of fuel involved, and to do that, you know, what we just described, that even that level of extra production isn't actually going to help all that much, because that's just to fill the tanks of one ship. Now, granted, a ship doesn't burn all of its fuel normally in a single voyage, but one of Tirpitz's abortive missions with a handful of destroyers as escort burnt about 10-15% more fuel than would have been contained within Tirpitz herself had her tanks just been fully filled. So, yeah, to provide the Kriegsmarine with all the fuel it could possibly want to fuel every ship it has to sail regularly, you're talking about an order of magnitude more synthetic fuel production than Germany actually used. And the Regia Marina is considerably larger than the Kriegsmarine, so figure that in, and you're talking about you know, not only increasing German synthetic fuel production by an order of magnitude, but probably increasing that by either an order of magnitude or at least probably a factor of five. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's a huge amount of coal extraction that's going to be going on. Nonetheless, assuming that that does ha occur, it's probably not going to make a huge difference to the Kriegsmarine, because whilst the Kriegsmarine did suffer from fuel shortages and that did limit their operations, the simple fact of the matter is that by the time fuel economy was forced on the Kriegsmarine in any kind of significant way, you were looking at a period by which the Royal Navy and the US Navy have put enough ships in place that sailing more frequently just means the German surface fleet gets destroyed quicker. Now, of course, if they had all the fuel there in the world that they wanted, you could potentially have a battle group of Tirpitz, Scharnhorst, Hipper, Prince Eugen, Scheer and Lutzau sailing out, which would be quite powerful, you know, two battleships and four heavy cruisers. But the simple fact is when you look at the convoy escorts that were being run on the Arctic convoys around the time that those ships were all available historically... You're looking at the Allies sailing with a couple of treaty battleships and an aircraft carrier and a bunch of cruisers and destroyers, etc., etc. So you might have had a slightly more spectacular battle, but the Kriegsmarine's heavy surface units may well have been wiped out before the end of 1943, considering that the US Navy tended to use the Arctic convoys as kind of the extended shakedown voyage area for the various North Carolina and South Dakota class battleships as they came online, with notable exceptions for some of the lead vessels like North Carolina. But if you travel south with the Regia Marina, that is an entirely different story, because if the Germans are able to provide the Regia Marina with as much fuel as it likes, well, the Regia Marina have considerably more battleships available. They have, well, they have considerably more everything available than the Germans do. And they're a lot closer to areas where a significant Regia Marina task force could exert a big effect on the war as compared to the bases for the Kriegsmarine. That is not a pretty scenario because the US Navy doesn't really move into the Mediterranean in any significant force uh, 
early on in its involvement with uh, World War Two. You know, Ranger and Massachusetts being at the extreme western end for Operation Torch is about as enthusiastic as they get. When the Allies are landing in Sicily, for example, the heavy force that is deployed by the Allies to block any potential Italian fleet movement is made up entirely of Royal Navy capital units. But winding the clock back even further than that, when you're looking at a period when it is just the Royal Navy and Within that, you're looking at basically Admiral Cunningham's Mediterranean fleet and Force H being the container for the Italian Navy. If the Italians have enough fuel to regularly deploy two, three, four battleships, plus most of their heavy cruisers and light cruisers and destroyer force, that force regularly deploying is a force that Admiral Cunningham and Force H at their historic uh, force levels essentially can't really match you know if if Vittorio Veneto sails out with an escort like she did for the run-up to Cape Maspan Admiral Cunningham with two or three older battleships including War Spike plus a carrier to take pot shots at Ven Vittorio Veneto yeah he can deal with that if Vittorio Veneto shows up with Littorio and whichever ones of the Cavours and Duilios are in service at that point and haven't been torpedoed at Taranto and later on perhaps even shows up with Roma in tow as well yeah this is just starting to get a lot more difficult especially as I said if the deployments are regular at which point that is going to have a very significant difference on the on the Mediterranean campaign now that's not to say that the British can't counter that but it is going to rather radically redefine other areas of operation the British can't really afford to slacken their grip on northern waters, even as the US Navy shows up to help. The British are still going to want to keep at least one one or two fast capital ships plus carriers in there. But Force Z, for example, may not end up being deployed to uh, the Far East because the need for at least one modern vast capital ship and ideally another vast capital ship generally may well demand that Prince of Wales and Repulse are redeployed to the Mediterranean so perhaps Repulse will go to join Renown in Force H because Renown and Repulse together you know they can quite happily deal with an Italian force that contains a couple of their older you know Cavour Duilio types but Admiral Cunningham's force will desperately need something like Prince of Wales to be able to stand off against regular deployments by multiple Littorios. And likewise for heavy cruisers. One or two Italian heavy cruisers turning up is something that the Royal Navy's Mediterranean Fleet light cruiser units can either kite in towards heavier units, or if there's only maybe one, they might feel confident enough to try attacking it. But four or five of them showing up? that means you're going to need counties in there. And if you're going to bring counties, maybe Dorsetshire and Cornwall, um, yeah, the Royal Navy would have to essentially pull everything they historically had in the Indian Ocean up to and including things like Hermes in order to counter this, plus pull in resources from home. So it would become a very, very fraught issue. And obviously, if at all possible, I mean, Anson Howe, Duke of York possibly even I mean Duke of York and King George V might be the fast ships kept up north but yeah there, there'll be a lot more ships thrown into the Mediterranean and you might actually have multiple multi-battleship fights going on because the Italians will have enough force out there to feel confident engaging the British and the British can't in most circumstances afford not to engage the Italians and given that the Italians will have the overall speed advantage if the Italians want to fight unless it's Force H with just Renown and Repulse, there's not a lot the British can do to refuse that fight. Glenn Ricafrente asks, In a previous dry dock, you mentioned the capability gap between the first C-Class cruiser and the last one to be commissioned. In your opinion, which class or classes had the widest capability gap between the first and last ships of the class, assuming the ships are in their original forms? therefore excluding modernization, reconstruction, or conversion. I think it's going to depend on where you draw the line at modernization, because obviously, especially in wartime, ships' capabilities, if they're producing larger numbers of ships, like, say, a 
Fletcher class or a Cleveland class can vary quite considerably from a first of class vessel, which in those cases might have a basic surface search radar and a relatively minimal light to medium AA armament, to the end of class, which might have surface search, air search, gunnery control, air, anti air gunnery control, IFF, etc., etc., radar systems and might have a different number of main guns, a different number of torpedo launchers in the case of the Fletcher, and definitely a very different amount of medium and light anti-aircraft weaponry. Now, the capability of the last Fletcher or the last Cleveland built is going to be radically different on launch from the capability of USS Fletcher or USS Cleveland, and technically they haven't; those last vessels haven't gone into dry dock again to be modernized but in some books you will see that they'll say the design had been modernized whilst the class was under construction but then at the same time i guess you could say that for the c class as well so it, it really depends where you draw the line on how much internal change to a class's layout can be made before you call it a modernization and to a certain extent it also depends on what you consider to be a capability gap because ultimately if you look at the c class for example by the time you go from the first subclass to the last subclass the absolute firepower has increased quite significantly because they've gone from a pair of six inch aft to an entirely six inch battery obviously dropping the four inch this doubled the number of torpedo launchers and increased a knot in speed. So in terms of if you are lined up at conventional battle ranges against a ship like say Cleopatra or Conquest and it opens fire on you and you compare that to being lined up against a ship like Cape Town or Carlisle, the latter is just physically going to hit you a lot harder per broadside assuming the same number of hits. And obviously, as I said, it's going to be a fraction faster as well. So to a certain degree, I'd probably stick with the C-Class. When you compare that to our aforementioned examples of to a fairly long run, but modified on the stocks designs like the Fletchers and Clevelands, in a lot of cases, at least if you're looking at anti-surface firepower, the Fletcher certainly, and to a certain extent the Cleveland either has the same or actually potentially slightly reduced firepower but it will probably still actually hit you harder because it's much more likely to hit now you could say the same for the Carolines because oh the C-Class because by the time the last of them are being launched they've got much improved fire control but the difference in improvements of fire control across World War One, although it in cruisers as it went from not having any to having some in terms of centralized uh, fire control computers but the changes in accuracy compared to you know going from having no radar gunnery control just surface search radar to full radar gunnery control that's a much bigger leap so as I said, you know even if you're up against uh, a late war fletcher that's maybe dropped one of its torpedo launchers and possibly even dropped a main gun it's going to land a lot more shells on you, which means that although the individual broadside is weaker, you're probably going to end up with more of those shells actually hitting you. So, yeah, it's it's a difficult one. And as I say, if you want to go by absolute firepower changes, then I'd probably stay with the C-Class. But if you want to go with effective firepower delivered downrange, regardless of the actual number and type of weapons on board, I think the Fletcher is probably going to be one of the strongest contenders. That is, of course, assuming that we leave out ships where classes have had massively interrupted build times. Because obviously if you lay down a class of ships in, let's say, the late 1930s, and one of them gets completed, and then World War II interrupts and then maybe you don't complete the other one until much 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 later post-war 
then that capability gap is going to be absolutely colossal, like Richelieu and Jean Barr, for example. Bill Luster asks, how much more speed could the US standard type battleships have made if the extra tonnage spent on turboelectric drive had been used solely on up-to-date boilers and turbines and modest hull changes? Would the later fast battleships have been meaningfully slower if turbine and boiler tonnage had been reduced to add turboelectric drive? So it's generally a little bit difficult to determine because you do have other changes that are made even in what are necessarily supposed to be comparative design options. So in theory you get ships that are exactly the same armament, exactly the same hull length, dimensions, etc, etc. One with geared turbines and one with turbo electric drive. But there are additional features. So sometimes they change the fuel load to get the same range, which obviously means the turbines need more, which changes things. And very often, even when they don't do that, if they just accept, look, we've got a fixed amount of fuel, fixed dimensions of the hull, fixed armament, the additional space and weight taken up by the turbo electric drive means that if they're designing them to the same displacement, <laughs> you end up with the turbo electric drive ship sacrificing armor, which means it's not, you know, a straight comparison of a ship with exactly the same capabilities in all the other respects. And is it going to be faster, slower, way more, way less? Um, there are a very few that come close, and one or two that are actually you know, stat identical, say, for speed, but they are in the minority. But looking at the designs that are the closest to a direct straight-up comparison between turbines and turboelectric drive, it seems that if nothing else changes, you're looking at a speed difference of about one to one and a half knots, and potentially uh, in extremis up to about two knots so that's if you have your uh, turbo electric drive ship and let's say it's capable of 21 knots or with a given amount of armor armament and hull dimensions if you swap that out for geared turbines the weight savings that you get which obviously then mean you've got theoretically similar power output driving a lighter ship through the water that as I said that seems to buy about a knot to a knot and a half maybe a little bit more um if you can you know use the fact you're using up less space to maybe slim the hull slightly so let's say we take a, a value of a knot and a half now would a knot and a half have affected the north carolinas and the south dakotas much well you're talking about dropping their speed to that kind of nebulous 26-ish knots, maybe a little bit faster or slower depending on the ship, which is still faster than the standard battle line, obviously, but it does actually now start to put the ships at a noticeable disadvantage against your average treaty battleship and a significant disadvantage against the slightly faster treaty battleships and or the treaty breakers, so Littorio, Richelieu, Bismarck, etc. With the Iowas, you know, you're dropping from ostensibly 33 knots down to 31 and a half, 32 knots, which for the upper end of fast battleships, I mean, it's not a terrible speed, but it does mean the Iowas are now running in a pack of the fastest fast battleships rather than being the clear leaders. But Regardless of that, if you swap out turbo electric drive on a ship that was designed for geared turbines, you are going to be worrying quite a lot about all that additional space the turbo electric drive has taken up, and how is that going to eat into your torpedo defense system? F-19A Ghost Rider asks, I think a fair argument can be made that a US-Japanese clash was inevitable from the turn of the 20th century onward at some point. In a similar vein, do you think that the Anglo-German naval rivalry of pre-World War I made the conflict between the two empires inevitable? Assuming for the sake of argument that a World War I-esque conflict that drags both of them in doesn't break out, would they have come to blows eventually, either in the North Sea or in a colonial conflict? 
I think there's two ways of approaching this. You can look at it in principle or and you can look at it in terms of exactly what happened. So if we assume that the trigger for World War One itself didn't occur, in terms of exactly what happened, as I've mentioned in a number of other dry docks before and in the video on the Anglo-German naval arms race, the Germans had effectively thrown in the towel and conceded in 1912. They'd massively rode back on their naval building program, while the British, it seemed, had just caught a second wind and were building even more ships even more rapidly, um, and even larger ones. So if you put World War I off and say that maybe some form of conflict, or tension at least, flares up between the British and the Germans towards the end of the 1910s, well, by that point, looking at the predicted German build plan and looking at the predicted British build plan, the Royal Navy would have reasserted a very considerable gap once again. Um, Obviously, not quite the two power standard in terms of hull numbers, but potentially, at least by broadside weight, maybe actually reaching back towards a two power standard because the mid to late 1910s would have seen the Royal Navy building an awful lot of 15 and possibly 16, 16 and a half or 18 inch armed ships, whilst the Germans, although building a few, wouldn't have been building nearly as many. So compared to the earlier ships obviously being 11, 12, 13.5 inch, etc., the gap at the top of things would be considerably wider. So at that point, although Germany would have a numerically fairly large fleet, it, the British may be looking at it similar to the way they looked at the French ironclad fleet in, let's say, the early to mid-1870s. You know, large enough to be a threat but not enough to be existential, and there's enough spare capacity in the fleet to send ships overseas. Also, depending on what political developments occur in the UK without World War I bringing them to a screaming halt, but that's a separate matter. However, if we look at the whole thing in principle, because, of course, Germany throwing in the tail in 1912 doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to pick things up again in, say, the 1920s, by which point pretty much everything that's not armed with a 15-inch gun is going to be obsolete, so they could maybe restart things with uh, mass builds of 16 or 18-inch armed ships. The overall principle of an Anglo-German naval rivalry, where Germany is constantly trying to build up to a fleet that is a significant portion of the size of the Royal Navy, much more than the Royal Navy is comfortable with, that ultimately would lead to some kind of conflict. Because, again, as I mentioned before, for Germany in the 1900s, 1910s, etc., a fleet beyond a basic defensive fleet to keep most enemies from showing up off your coast and shooting you with impunity is essentially a luxury item. Germany is a continental land power. It needs, at that point, an army and then latterly an air force to help defend its land borders. As, as I say, as long as it's got enough defensive equipment at sea to stop people coming after it on its own coastline, strictly speaking, it doesn't need anything more of a navy. You know, you Yes, you could blockade Germany, as the Royal Navy did, and slowly starve it into submission, but that's when Germany is surrounded, for the most part, by enemies. And, okay, yeah, they have Austria-Hungary in World War One, but Austria-Hungary is not exactly able to trade overseas and then trade with Germany. Whereas, uh, you know, Germany that's fighting Russia or France, or Russia and France, as long as it's okay with Britain, can still happily trade. Whereas for the British, being an island nation who depend on, for, on the sea, not just for their empire, but to you know, actually feed the island, a navy is a requirement and the army is the luxury beyond a relatively small professional force to keep order within the empire. Britain, unlike Germany, doesn't need its army, but absolutely needs its navy. So... A, an enemy with a large navy 
is a potential existential threat to Britain, and sooner or later, human nature being what it is, if you start building an existential threat and both sides are brandishing those existential threats around, someone's going to start shooting sooner or later. That's just the way humanity has always gone with these kinds of things. You can't have two very large land forces with extremely large armies sitting next to each other with a shared land border for any particular length of time before they come to blows unless there is some absolutely colossal physical interface between them that prevents that. And likewise, there's never been a period where two nations that aren't already specifically allied have had huge fleets and not eventually come to blows sooner rather than later. Sam Signorelli asks... Had the Russian crews been actually trained and reasonably competent in sea warfare, how might Tsushima have gone? We do have to be careful when it comes to Tsushima, because yes, whilst the, there were a lot of things that were found wanting about the 2nd Pacific Squadron, they weren't completely incompetent when it came to the Battle of Tsushima. Their gunnery was you know, surprisingly good for what they had to work with their main downfalls were the fact that their ammunition was nowhere near as effective as the japanese so the hits that they landed whilst they did do a fair bit of damage weren't anywhere near as damaging as the return fire and secondly and well maybe not even secondly probably the single biggest thing that really did did in the second pacific squadron was the fact that whilst they proved at least a decent number of their ships could hit things, their ability to both hold formation and change formation was still pretty terrible. And that, more than anything, is is what did the Russians in, because they just couldn't adapt quickly enough to take advantage of some of the opportunities that the Japanese fleet afforded them. Now, if you in terms of changing their training because you know no matter how much training you have that's not going to change your ammunition types but in terms of changing your training if you combine the gunnery training that Rosasvetsky had had his ships do with maneuvering training that actually stuck they're still again going to be at something of a disadvantage due to the age and slow speed of some of the ships they have with them but if they're able to switch from line astern to line abreast relatively quickly and hold that formation in a nice, neat order, then potentially even with their somewhat less effective ammunition, they could have caused the Japanese some very serious problems because if they can exacerbate the number of hits on Togo's fleet as it's doing its 180... And maybe cripple one or two of the leading vessels that throws the entire Japanese formation into confusion and then a much more organized Russian battle line can turn and exert its maximum number of guns on that milling confused Japanese fleet whose own gunnery will obviously be adversely affected by the fact they're going in all directions at once trying to avoid crippled ships in their path and you know enough hits will cumulatively tell. It's still going to be an uphill struggle because, as I said, you know every Japanese heavy shell that hits is exponentially more effective. But it might offer the Russians an opportunity to at least make Tsushima a draw, if not an outright win. Now, if you combined that with the Russians having more modern, more up-to-date shells, so they now have the gunnery they went into Tsushima with, but with, say, an average rather than a below average level of sea keeping and formation keeping and modernish ammunition, then they could not 100%, but you know, maybe 60, 40, 70, 30 pull off a win because that double back that Togo did, that was incredibly risky. He got away with it because of the conditions of the Second Pacific Squadron, but pulling off a 180 in the face of an enemy that can shoot straight and hold formation, you 
is a recipe for disaster in almost all circumstances. The only other near contemporary point where that kind of thing happened would be Windy Corner at the Battle of Jutland, where the 5th Battle Squadron had to do a similar 180 in the face of combined enemy fire. And in that case, they could do it pretty darn quickly with an awful lot of firepower they could chuck out in response against a portion of the high seas fleet using some of the biggest and toughest ships on the planet at the time. And even then, you look at the damage to War Spite and Barham, etc., they very nearly didn't get away with it, thanks, BT. Um, now, if 5th Battle Squadron had been more average ships, you know, 12 or 13.5 inch armed ships, they would not have gotten away with that. And, you know, Togo doesn't have the equivalent of the Queen Elizabeths in pre dreadnought form to sustain the kind of damage they would have taken had the, those changes that we just mentioned occurred within the second pacific squadron dylan bartlett asks i've been researching the spanish armored cruiser emperador carlos v and can you shed any insight on the nightmare that is its armor scheme and why it's made up of multiple types of armor firstly you have to look at when the ship was built uh, when emperador carlos v was under construction and being designed as well so very late 1880s and early 1890s Armour is undergoing a radical change. In a very short time period, you go from compound armour, so iron on top of steel, to basic steel armour, i.e. you know, just nickel steel, usually from Crusoe, to face-hardened armour, also called Harvey armour, and then in the latter part of the 1890s you get onto Krupp, but you're essentially going through, the, in the period that the, this ship is being designed three different stages of armour, and of course those types of armour have slightly different applicable uses. The belt armour is the most obvious, and, well, the turret armour as well, but in this case the ship doesn't have an armoured belt. That 2.2 inch you can see indicated on the diagram is in fact her turtle pack deck, and deck armour, especially at that thickness, is... Call, well, it calls for slightly different materials compared to belt armour. And you see this kind of mixed armour type um, in materials used in quite a number of different ships from a number of different nations in this time period, where they're essentially trying to grab the best that they can, uh, both in terms of resistive power, but also as resistive power increases, of course, then weight can decrease for the same you know, defensive capability assuming the manufacturers can make the armour in the required thicknesses. So, you know, it's just a factor of the time period. Now, as far as the armour scheme goes, the Emperador Carlos V is based, uh, at least according to contemporary accounts, somewhat by, on or influenced by the British Blake-class cruisers. Much as the Infanta de Maria Teresa's were kind of based off of the Orlando class, which isn't exactly a surprise because obviously Britain was the leading naval power at the time, people are going to imitate you. Uh, much like these days, we have the various different flavours of Aegis ships that all look like Burks that somebody has gone and stretched, squashed, etc. etc. Now, in the case of the Imperador Carlos, her design is not quite as silly as the Infanta Maria Teresa's, because let's face it, the Orlandos were pretty silly as well. The thing was that the Orlandos, being recognised as a somewhat silly design, the Royal Navy had decided actually we're not going to do armoured cruisers anymore because at the time, when compound armour was the best available, they just thought we, we can't actually make this work. And they'd gone for big cruisers, so the size of armoured cruisers, but with just protected decks. So protected cruiser layout on armoured cruiser size, which they called first-class armoured cruisers, which are the Blakes, Powerfuls, etc., etc. Emperor Carlos V follows this design idea. So you can see she's got the turtle back armour to theoretically keep her underwater bit protected. She's got a minimal amount of armour on her secondary battery gallery deck which makes a certain amount of sense because it will resist incoming secondary battery fire which hopefully will keep her secondary battery in operation longer than her theoretical opponents and then you've got the fore and aft guns which are 
more properly enclosed barbettes, uh, again in keeping with stuff at this time. And yeah, they, they put a fair bit of armour on there, albeit, again, because this is a very evolving situation, it's not the world's best choice. It's a lot of armour for a, a fair degree of impact on stability. And as, again, contemporary accounts of the time noted, because this is a more classic barbette, i.e. a sort of unarmoured gun pit, as opposed to the barbette we'd be used to much later on, which runs all the way down to the magazines, and it doesn't have any belt protection of any description. Uh, as I said, contemporary accounts note that all you need to do to knock out one of these guns is not actually necessarily hit the turret, but hit the hull underneath the turret, and obviously the explosion and the shrapnel will go up, underneath and knock out the turret without penetrating the armor so the short version is it's the early 1890s everyone's building things that are thoroughly confused and not necessarily particularly good and in this particular case it someone's taken the the blake class design and tried to make a full-on armored cruiser dash potentially even a small battleship level of weaponry on what's essentially the, the the lesser of the two cruiser types worth of protection. Andrew Dederer asks, A recent book about World War II points out that the German Wehrmacht dined out on the French campaign of 1940, i.e. everything went right for them, when in fact that was the one time they had months to plan and rehearse the entire operation. In the same way, was Tsushima a false predictor for major fleet actions to come? Togo knew where the Rus Russians had to come from, when they would reach him, and he had several months to drill his command in their roles, even without wireless. Conversely, Jutland was an utter command mess, with not enough reporting taking too long to process and a general assumption that the commander must know. The High Seas fleet wasn't all that much better, and they got away mainly because they had a specifically prepared Cheez-It signal in place. Would a more confused encounter at Tsushima have alerted navies to the massive issues involved in making contact in open ocean, where you don't know where the enemy is starting from or heading towards? Would a messy Tsushima force the Royal Navy to impose doctrine instead of having each force write its own instructions? Tsushima was, to a certain degree, quite messy. Um, as covered in a previous related question, you know, Russian ability to execute the signals they were given was not particularly fantastic so on the Russian side things got were quite messy and at points even on the Japanese side there were a, f a few areas where they were very lucky not and I'm not just talking about the turn here I'm talking about when ships were actually damaged and other ships had to come up and support and so forth communications to a certain degree broke down relatively quickly but it was a combination of training and initiative, as well as eventually being able to read the signals that brought the Japanese through those things. To a certain degree, whether you look at Tsushima or Jutland, things were a lot more predictable than they had been previously. Because remember in the Age of Sail, I mean, in any almost any naval battle, where and when the enemy is going to show up on the vast expanse of the ocean is the ultimate question if you want to have a fight you have to be in the same place as the enemy at the same time and you know back in the age of sail that that was even more of a, a question with Tsushima though you can see Togo applying pretty much the same principles that age of sail commanders had applied in ages past yes he knew where and when the Russians had to come from but he had deduced this because he knew what the Russian objective was, and if he knew what the Russian objective was, there were only a certain number of ways they could move to fulfil that, at which point it was a question of combining intelligence on what he knew the Russians were doing, along with positioning his fleet in such a way as to shut down some of the Russians' other options, i.e. you know, go for a choke point or similar, and then essentially wait whereas if you look at something like Trafalgar again you know you have the Franco-Spanish fleet they're sort of cornered in a port so rather than sitting back in the channel although obviously Calder's fleet was there um, but for Nelson's fleet rather than sit back in the channel and wait for the Franco-Spanish fleet to sail whenever they liked heading in whatever direction they liked to get to 
presumably the English Channel at some point. Obviously, there'd been this whole chase at first, but in the immediate lead up to Trafalgar, Nelson was sitting off the port because then it meant if Villeneuve left, he had to go past Nelson. So he's forming a choke point. As for when, well, for the age of sail, that was less of a concern because as long as you kept everybody in food and drink, you could sit off a port or you know run a convoy escort for weeks or months. In the age of steam, when you're limited by how much fuel you're carrying, this is perhaps more of a concern, but obviously intel gathering had got a bit better as well. The Well, there are many problems with Jutland, but one of the bigger ones was in some ways an over-reliance on technology, and it's not a new thing. When the flag signal system came into effect in full at, towards the end of the 18th century, there were periods where admirals insisted on trying to micromanage their fleet via flag signals, and people assumed that if the admiral wasn't you know, signaling a specific instruction, he must know, because, hey, we've got this complicated signal system, so everybody must be telling him what's going on, he must know everything, and therefore he's giving us the appropriate instructions, so if he hasn't given us instructions, then we don't need to do anything. And then once the telegraph system comes into play, again, you see people more remotely trying to micromanage ships, and then when you get to Jutland, you've got the radio systems aboard ships, which can now do, you know, intership communication on top of the signal flags and signal lights in somewhat longer range and or poorer weather conditions. And again, it's this kind of, ah, but we have improved our communications. This will clearly solve all our problems. And then everyone assuming that the mere existence of these systems has solved the problems and rather missed the fact you have to actually use them properly which is not unique to Jutland, it's not unique to Tsushima, it's not unique to Trafalgar, and it's not unique to today either. So I think there was enough confusion at Tsushima to alert people to the need for clear and consistent signalling, which in part is why um, radio and better flag signals and signal lights etc. were developed in the period between Tsushima and Jutland. And theoretically, if you look at the core of doctrine at Jutland, both sides' core doctrine was actually pretty solid. The problem with Jutland, apart from you know, the assumption that modern technology would solve everything in the minds of some, was the fact that new technology and the methods of its use had been layered upon older doctrine without it all quite being put together. So there were some lessons in better communication and cohesion that came out of Tsushima, but because Tsushima didn't involve ships operating with radio communication and so forth it meant that by the time you got to something like Jutland whatever you put together that took into account the lessons from Tsushima was always going to have this slightly uncomfortable not quite aligned overlay of newer technology and that can't really be 100% aligned unless you either do an absolutely massive fleet exercise and are very honest about the results and the circumstances where things could get confused actually come up, or you have a big battle and are forced to confront those issues in the aftermath. Texas and La Choc asks, How superstitious were submariners as opposed to other sailors in general? My thinking is that superstition stems from fear, which comes from not understanding the ocean. Estate mariners have existed in for millennia, whilst submariners need to have a more in-depth, no pun intended, understanding of the oceans as the medium they travel through, so I would think they'd be less inclined to superstition. I appreciate the general point, but I would say that just because you understand something doesn't necessarily mean you don't still fear it, rationally or irrationally, and especially with the ocean, you can understand an awful lot about the ocean. And in some ways that actually makes it even more terrifying. However, submariners as a whole, whilst they're not possessed of exactly the same superstitions as sailors in general, in part because they spend a decent amount of their time underwater, and at least in the time period the channel covers, there is still a crossover and some unique superstitions that go on. Because you've got to remember, these days, the submariner culture has probably diverged quite significantly from surface ship culture, because these days most submarines do spend 
the vast majority of their time underwater. But back in the time period the channel covers, submarines spend most of their time, statistically speaking, above water because they have a limited dive capability. So in that respect, they are a relatively small, not hugely seaworthy boat out there in the middle of the ocean, which generally tends to actually breed more superstitious behavior than somebody who's on a massive ship that feels like it might be invincible, at least up until you know the first major storm system comes along. Um, but during the time period that you exist under the water, and even when you are on the surface, you, most of the crew are down in the hull, um, it does breed a slightly different set of superstitions. So, you know, you can have e very basic things, you, you know, like when you're under depth charge attack and everyone's like, shh, shh, you have to be absolutely quiet. It's like, yes, in theory, if you make noise, you could be heard on the hydrophones. But realistically, if you've got a bunch of depth charges exploding around you, whether or not one person sneezes is not really going to show up because whoever's listening to the hydrophones is going to be, you know, holding their headphones well away from them because there's a bunch of massive explosions going on. But the idea that everyone has to be absolutely dead quiet, even while there's a bunch of explosive detonating around you, otherwise you're going to die. I mean, it has a good practical effect as a rule of thumb, but in and of itself, that's more superstition than fact. You're quiet to try and avoid detection. If people are chugging depth charges on your head, you, you probably have failed in that respect. So I think, at least for the time period the channel covers once more, the submariners will share a certain degree of the superstitions of above water sailors. But whilst, yes, overall they might be a little less superstitious because they are face-to-face -face with the technology of their posting pretty much 24-7, they also will have a subset of their own ideas about what they should and shouldn't do for luck. Excelsior1 asks, Playing World of Warships is often suggested to bow tank and back up. I just don't think this is realistic. I can't imagine an IO-class battleship just stopping and starting to reverse. Was it common in real navies? It seems you'd be very vulnerable to airstrikes, submarine torpedoes, and other surface combatants. There is a small degree of veracity to the general concept of bow tanking, but for most of it, what you see in World of Warships is not realistic. The overall idea of not sailing perpendicular to your opponent in order to present a slightly smaller target and a somewhat better angle on your armor does have merit. And where possible, especially in World War II when ship formations were slightly smaller, people would try to adopt this. The problem is, of course, that that means you're either sailing towards your enemy or away from your enemy rather than at the same distance from your enemy, which means you are going to be constantly changing the range. That, up until the sort of mid to late period of World War II, could pose a more significant issue for your fire control computers. Plus, also, you're changing the tactical situation all the time because if you, let's say, have an ideal battle range where your armor will protect you against enemy shells in theory and your enemy's armor won't protect you protect him against your shells well if you are going away from them so i guess stern tanking at that point then you're getting to a point where the enemy's armor will now protect him against your shells or if you close in you are approaching a point where eventually the enemy shells will overcome your armor so there are ups and downs to, to all of this. But as I said, there is a, a small basis of that. However, the kind of nose in or almost no, completely nose in, you know, within zero to 20 degrees or so, slow down and reverse to try and keep the range, that is very unrealistic. Airstrikes and submarine strikes in the middle of a ship to ship combat scenario are usually relatively unlikely or airstrikes perhaps somewhat less so um, but slowing down significantly is going to make your enemy's fire control solution so much easier and if you are 
going particularly slow. The other thing, which again most gamers don't model, is that your ship becomes significantly more affected by the sea conditions because you don't have all that much inertia anymore. So you're going to start rolling and pitching considerably more. Well, your roll and pitch is going to be a considerably greater portion of your ship's overall movement than if you were moving at 20, 25, 30 knots. And that, because it's not predictable in the way that I'm moving at X speed or I'm turning at Y degrees per second, is going to make your own fire control solution significantly more difficult. So you're, you're, you're nerfing yourself whilst boosting your enemy. And there's a couple of other factors. Uh, again, uh, weirdly enough, World of Warships did have a flooding mechanic back when it was in beta. Uh, but if you bow tank World of Warship style, if someone rips up your bow, you've now got massive amounts of flooding in your bow. That's going to limit your ability to move forward at speed later on in absolute terms. And also there's a bunch of flooding in your bow, possibly fires. You know, this is not a good situation to be in just because your citadel hasn't been breached. I mean, okay, your citadel being breached is worse, but having your bow ripped up is still not good. I mean, just ask Bismarck what happens when you have a single major hole in your bow. Plus, shells can travel down the length of the relatively unprotected bow, and then they'll hit the bulkhead, which hopefully you have, that joins the two sides of your citadel. And of course, the closer you are to being completely bow in, the more perpendicular the impact on that armor is going to be and that armor is usually thinner than your belt armor so you don't necessarily want it being hit even if the bow might have robbed some of the energy from the incoming shell and then finally a lot of the bow tanking relies in world of warships on arbitrary plate thicknesses which can arbitrarily bounce incoming armor piercing shells and as i've pointed out in previous dry docks Whilst there is a formula going on there to calculate all these things, the problem with strict formulas is that they assume things like perfectly rigid bodies, which is not the case. And you know, as I've, again, pointed out, and actually I think I demonstrated on a live stream at one point, that when you're talking about the energies involved with heavy naval shells colliding with metal, below certain thicknesses the whole you know well theoretically my 32 millimeter plate angled at 80 degrees is the equivalent of 15 inch plate so it's going to bounce something it just doesn't work because the plate will just crumple um, along its length as uh, i think i demonstrate you know you use a bit of paper card or foil you are theoretically coming up with something that you know represents a six inch or one foot thick block of paper card or aluminium but realistically, if you push a pencil or some other kind of projectile simulator along it, you'll end up just crumpling it all up because it just does not have the rigidity to withstand the energy, even if its theoretical thickness along the plane of advance is more than enough to stop the, whatever it is you're using. And it's the same thing, you know, 32 mil of plate, if it gets impacted even at 80 degrees by a supersonic 2700 pound shell it's literally just going to crumple like a sheet of blank paper it's not going to afford all that much protection dm phoenix asks every now and then a naval commander is called upon to lead non-marine ground forces such as admiral kolchak in the russian civil war admiral dala in north africa in 1942 and admiral dernitz at the very end of world war ii what aspects of their naval training and careers would have given them the ability to lead or coordinate ground forces? Did their respective armies resent the apparent overstepping of naval authority? Well, as admirals, obviously they would have had general training in tactics and strategy, obviously more specialised towards the seaborne elements of things, but even as an admiral, especially back in those days, you would be required to understand at least something of ground forces in part because you might be called to blow them up <laughs> in shore bombardments, so you needed to know how to do that. Plus, of course, naval brigades, be they of sailors or marines or both, were very popular in the late 19th century the early and the early 20th century, and to a lesser degree in the 20s and 30s, which 
covers the time period when the aforementioned admirals were all on their way up through their careers and whether you're a, leading a bunch of sailors a bunch of marines or a bunch of army troops obviously being trained in how to lead and potentially even taking part in some naval brigade landings would give you a basic understanding of infantry and artillery tactics and of course with being an admiral also comes a certain degree of logistical knowledge albeit things don't necessarily translate 100 percent i mean obviously nelson was a very successful admiral the less said about his attempts to be a general on land in the italian campaigns well the better now in general obviously armies are not going to necessarily appreciate being led and ordered around by admirals the same way that fleets don't generally appreciate being ordered and led around by generals but it depends very much on a case-by-case -case basis because while it's the general rule if you're in the middle of a war and the admiral happens to be by a fair margin the most senior officer around well that's better than nothing and as i mentioned you know especially in the time period the channel covers the chances of an admiral at least having a passing familiarity with infantry tactics logistics and ground warfare are somewhat higher than perhaps they would be these days and that in turn means that the army units the ground forces would be receiving orders that hopefully would at least make a certain degree of sense and of course general logistics planning and leadership are part of what makes an admiral an admiral so essentially if you're a good admiral in the 19th and early 20th centuries there was a reasonable chance you could be a passable to decent general as well albeit obviously unless you get those one in a million people who are just brilliant at absolutely everything someone who's a really really good general on land will generally get the better of an admiral who is might be really really good at sea but as i said might be passable to decent on land but that's where trusting your subordinates comes in which is another part of being a flag officer j mace asks in a previous dry dock you mentioned that the aircraft carrier uss carl vinson had the nickname of the battle star since my dad served on that ship, I was curious, how did it get that name? I know it's a little bit outside of the period the channel covers, but I suspect that how warships get their nicknames is not classified or political. So obviously this is considerably outside the wheelhouse of the time period the channel covers, but from what I've been able to discern, what happened was you had USS Nimitz, and then you had USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, and the Eisenhower commissioned in 1977, and then Carl, the Carl Vinson was launched in 1980, commissioned in 1982. And at the time, obviously there's a five-year gap between Eisenhower and Vinson being launched, well, being commissioned. And during that period, there was actually quite a significant advance in the state of electronic systems aboard ships in the US Navy. Plus, from Carl Vincent onwards the Nimitz class were designed with expanded capability particularly against underwater threats and all of that led to the fact that the electronic suite um, in, in terms of general equipment and specific consoles etc was considerably more advanced in the Carl Vincent than it was on the previous uh, ships and between the commissioning of the two carriers a certain series called Battlestar Galactica had come out and so when everybody got aboard the newly commissioned aircraft carrier looked around and went "Ooh, fancy new shiny electronics on really big ship it was a fairly natural conclusion to give it the nickname the Battlestar which is not the only nickname that Carl Vinson carries um, for those uh, in the 1980s who weren't necessarily fans of Battlestar Galactica, uh, some also dubbed it Starship Vinson for similar reasons. Matt Blom asks, The Latorio-class battleships have always been a favourite of mine, and I've always wondered if there were any notable design or engineering differences between members of the class. There are some subtle differences if you know what to look for. Between Latorio and Roma, there are actually very few differences 
the Italians did a pretty good job of actually keeping a class, you know, actually a class as opposed to several loosely related designs like, say, the Hippers. Um, but when it comes to Littorio and Vittorio Veneto, there's a few very minor differences in and around the soup structure, but that's pretty much it. However, Littorio and Vittorio Veneto were built as a pair and Roma and Impero were built as a separate pair much later on. Obviously, Impero was never completed, so we're never going to know what she was going to look like, but there are a few much more easily notable differences between Roma and the previous two. Um, for example, Roma is a slightly longer vessel and has a more flared and steeper bow, so you're seeing here Vittorio Veneto and Littorio. So if you look at a picture of Roma, you'll notice the bow flares much more forward, and that makes uh, Roma slightly longer as well. Uh, Roma also, in a many pictures, doesn't appear to have the second starboard anchor, which you can see here the earlier ships did. And then when you look at the superstructure, um, there are a few notable differences there as well. Between the funnels, there's considerably more equipment on Roma. There's also a lot more going on on the upper work. So you can see in in this case, you've got the two rangefinder setups above the bridge sitting there like sort of wedding cake hats. On Roma, there's a bunch of electronics sitting above that on the little mast that sticks up above. And also um, there are fairly visible windows installed on the fire control rangefinder platforms on Roma. Now as you can see on uh, Vittorio and Veneto and Littorio there are slightly smaller ones but on Roma the pictures tend to suggest these are slightly larger and somewhat compensatory for this I guess. Roma's actual bridge which obviously on these ships you can see the bridge structure is just overlooking the super firing forward main turret Roma's bridge is actually slightly more compact and closer in to the main superstructure tower compared to Littorio and Vittorio Veneto. So once you know those clues, it's actually relatively easy to tell the difference between Roma and her two predecessors, but telling the difference between Littorio and Vittorio Veneto just based purely on visuals is much, much harder. Alternate historian Turtle Duck asks, what three ships, whether built or paper, do you personally like, but are either impractical, inefficient, or completely crazy? Uh, for example, I like the idea of the Graf Spee because I find it amusing that there's a heavy cruiser armed with 11-inch guns. Well, top of my list has to be HMS Incomparable. You know, HMS Incomparable is the Tog 2 of the seas to me. Apart from anything else, it shares the joke with a tog, you know. I'll tell you a joke about HMS Incomparable, but it was too long. <laughs> um, seriously, if Incomparable had actually been built, there wouldn't have been a longer warship in the world, assuming that no one built some other equally nebulous design you know, that was even larger, but based on ships that were actually built, there wouldn't have been another warship in the world built longer than her in terms of waterline hull length until the Nimitz-class supercarriers. And in the almost certainly inevitable carrier conversion that would have occurred thanks to the Washington Naval Treaty, she may actually end up of with a flight deck of comparable length to a Nimitz, because of course, overhangs. Um, so yeah, incomparable definitely in terms of impractical ships. She's not necessarily inefficient for the time period, but Come on, she's a ship with absolutely monstrous guns and armor that is not going to repel any gun of that caliber or anything slightly smaller than that caliber. Then I'd also have to say possibly the French uh, Mogador class con contre torpilliers. You know, they are <laughs> hilariously impractical and inefficient. It's kind of they've taken the idea of a fast destroyer, fast large destroyer, and maybe run with it just a little bit too much as i've said before when it comes to the last few french contra torpilliers when you're running at a speed that's so high that you can't actually use your weapons because everything is just bouncing and vibrating so much you maybe have gone a little bit too far on the other hand they are achingly beautiful looking ships 
once they actually slow down, they're pretty decent in a fight. And, you know, who doesn't want to go charging around at speeds that would get you ticketed on quite a few different nations' highways? <laughs> and the final one, definitely a paper ship, would be Admiral Sartorius's ambitions for the Great Eastern, because you know, nothing really matches a name like Admiral Sartorius more than proceeding to propose that the Royal Navy take over or buy up the Great Eastern, cover it in turrets, and convert it into a gigantic 35,000-plus ton ramming ship, presumably with a very well-greased Sartorius standing on the bow with a massive drum you know, beating like a, a trireme coordinator as this absolutely monstrous vessel bears down on its opponents who can only wonder who exactly built this thing and then when they're told, oh yeah, that started out as a Brunel design, probably just nod sagely and accept their fate. Lord Quack, King of the Ducks, asks, Your thoughts on the definition of an aircraft carrier? See the attached image. Oh yes, one of those wonderful alignment charts. Now, I think, for me, if you're going to talk about a true aircraft carrier, then it would probably I would probably go with structure purist and doctrine purist. Um, if you start to shift doctrine for me, personally, I think it moves very rapidly out of the realm of being an aircraft carrier in the classic sense of the word. I mean, yes, technically a Burke or a Type 45 or you know any destroyer or frigate with a helicopter landing pad at the back, and especially a hangar, could be defined as an aircraft carrier in the strict ter terminology of it carries aircraft. Um, but by that sense, the Atlantic conveyor could be said to be an aircraft carrier because it carried harrier jump jets and in actual fact the atlantic conveyor would have a stronger um claim to being an aircraft carrier than a frigate because it's carrying fixed wing aircraft and it launched them even if it didn't recover them even though it's a civilian vessel so you know the atlantic conveyor would be actually in the same boat haha as the structure neutral doctrine purist which is where this amphibious assault ship is in this alignment chart. So I would say if you're going to stick with doctrine purist, going down to structure neutral, at least by the definition of this chart, seeing that the aircraft carrier is just a sea vessel rather than a large warship, that can apply in certain situations. So if you took a through-deck amphibious assault vessel and put a bunch of fighters on it, F-35s these days, Harriers a few years ago, that, to my mind, would make it an aircraft carrier along the same lines of escort carriers and light carriers in World War II. Yes, it's not a fleet carrier, so the fleet carrier is up there on the top left, but they would be an aircraft carrier of a sort. And then with the structure radical element, I think you could maybe make one or two forays down into structure radical. Um, not in the way that the chart suggests it, though. Um, but perhaps something like one of the flying aircraft carriers, so Akron or Macon, could go down there in the bottom left and still be considered aircraft carriers, or you know that 747 design that had a bunch of parasite fighters stuck in it instead of passengers. So for me, you could apply the term aircraft carrier to anything within the Doctrine Purist column, regardless of structure, but I think once you start shifting over and changing the doctrine of what actually is an aircraft carrier, you very quickly lose all definition. Matt Osborne asks, Why did Navy spend so much on searchlight technology when children with flashlights or torches could have figured out why they were a bad idea? Basically, it was a combination of a little bit of arrogance and part of most navies thinking that, of course, they would be the ones to use the searchlights against the enemy, and, of course, the enemy couldn't possibly return the favour. Plus, more prosaically, the searchlights, especially by the time of World War II, and to a certain extent in World War One, were also part of a much larger combat doctrine. Now, that's not to necessarily say that the people who had the searchlights necessarily 
actually followed the combat doctrine all the time uh, because of course what Matt is alluding to is the problem that once you switch on your searchlight in the middle of the dark you become just a little bit of a target for everybody because you can now be very easily seen and this happened to quite a number of ships on both sides in the Pacific War for instance the Pacific element of World War II but as an overall concept especially in one-on-ones searchlight's not necessarily such a bad idea if as I said you combine it with other technologies so you would try and figure out okay where is the enemy you see a ship you think it's the enemy and you need to get exact range figures and you also want to ruin their night vision and you want to see if you're actually hitting so the idea is you use stealth and cunning and potentially certainly by the second world war low light equipment to get yourself in a position where you're ready to drop the hammer on the enemy and then you activate the searchlights whilst simultaneously opening fire which is pretty much what Cunningham used uh, his radar to do at the Battle of Cape Matapan because then suddenly you have a bunch of high fidelity data about exactly how far away your opponent's ship is and in theory you're you know beaming quite a lot of candle power at them so although the ship in question that's being targeted can in theory work out where you are because you know there's a massive blinding light saying hey i'm over here at the same time there's a massive blinding light so figuring out exactly how to shoot that at any significant range is going to be quite difficult where this falls down of course is if that ship has friends (laughs) that you haven't noticed and then they start shooting at you but no plan is perfect and of course there was the other thing which is if somebody does get you in the searchlights in theory if you have bigger and meaner searchlights you the one thing you can do is point your searchlight back at them and hopefully blind their searchlight operators as much or more as as they are blinding you so yeah there's and you've also got the fact that again for multi-ship operations a ship that designates a target yes that ship might get shot up quite a bit but it might also disguise the fact you have a bunch of other ships nearby so you know turning the tables once more if you have say a battle squadron and you're sneaking up on an enemy battle squadron you might not want to reveal your position with searchlights but without those searchlights you might not have the right data to open fire and so you might get a destroyer that has several searchlights or a cruiser to highlight one or more targets at which point yes that cruiser or destroyer is probably not too long for this world but the flip side is that all of your battleships now can get some free shooting in on the targets that that ship has highlighted so yeah there are some fairly significant negatives for searchlights when it comes to being the one who's actually using them but if you play it right in small ship engagements or you have designated expendable searchlight ships in large ship engagements, or you actually manage to pull off the surprise attack with multiple ships using multiple searchlights against a similar size enemy formation, the way the Japanese did at first Savo, they can work. And and prior to the invention of radar, that's about the best you can hope for in the dark. You know, it's kind of a high risk, high reward strategy. Snowstalker36 asks, do you have any recommended books about Admiral Philip Vian? I see he had a memoir, but it doesn't seem to have been reprinted recently or digitized, and I haven't been able to track down a reasonable copy in the US. Well, unfortunately, in terms of dedicated biographies of Admiral Vian, you are really short of things. You've got his you know, own autobiography, which, as you mentioned, in the US could be hard to get hold of. You can also, if you sign up to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, um, e- well, you don't have to subscribe to them, but if you can either just pretend that you live in the UK to get a UK public library membership, which is usually free, or find someone in the UK who has one who's happy to let you use it, you can access their biography of him. So obviously that's an independent source. But outside of that, no one, as far as I'm aware, has written a full biography of Vian although he does appear in multiple 
compilation books talking about either World War II, the admirals who fought in World War II, or notable British admirals. So you can piece together, I guess, from several of those books, a decent picture of what he did and what his tactics were, etc., etc. That would probably be my go-to if you can't get a hold of his autobiography. And obviously that's going to be a, a list of three or four at least separate books, at which point I would suggest just drop me an email or Discord message and I can send you links and um, titles for all of those books. Sergeant Schultz asks, What, in your opinion, is the most absurd or silliest-looking warship from the time period the channel covers? And I'm preemptively barring Novgorod or any of Popov's designs. And for those of you who thought I was going to put up Hosh, sorry, not this time. Um, Hosh is indeed a slightly silly looking warship, but as I sometimes like to say, there is method to the madness, though madness it remains. But if, at least to my eye, and of course everything is in the eye of the beholder, the most absurd or silly looking quote unquote warships would be, you know, basically they're all either monitors or gunboats so you can pick from a selection of three in this case you have the italian monitor far di bruno as you can see here uh, the great roofed death raft and then there's her spiritual half sister hms drudge <laughs> yeah th th this is what happens when you tell the royal navy we need to get a very large gun up a river and then say no more Oh, oh, what, what, you meant other armament? You, you meant protection? You meant anything other than float a large gun upriver? Well, you should have been more specific. And in related news, of course, there's the adaptions of some of the Lord Clive class monitors. Yeah, we, we, we have a giant 18-inch gun. No, we, we can't actually fit it on the ship like a normal gun, because as we rotate it, it might you know, make things tip over and we can't really handle the recoil. So we're going to make it a fixed mount. And yes, we're keeping that twin 12 inch up front. And, and yes, we can only now shoot at things with our new gun on the starboard side. And yes, we have constructed a light railway to move the shells around the deck because there's no other way to physically load this thing. What, why are you looking at me odd? And of course, honorable mention has to go to HMS Furious in her original format because you know you're taking a courageous glorious furious type hull and experimenting with turning it into an aircraft carrier this is a good idea using it as a launch platform only so it has a forward flight deck only okay understandable not necessarily the best idea but understandable keeping a single 18 inch gun off to make it theoretically the world's most heavily armed aircraft carrier ever why exactly are we doing this <laughs> um although of course it does make for great meme quality david thornthwaite asks should robert blake have wider recognition as a naval commander of the highest renown nelson or togo level uh, very definitely for two reasons one of which is robert blake was originally a land officer um, in the New Model Army during the English Civil War. Then Parliament decided, you know what, we're going to take a bunch of generals and we're going to make them admirals, except we don't want to use the term admirals, so we're going to call them generals at sea. So this is a guy with no naval career, no officer's commission, uh, nothing of the sort, and he's just been told, right, guess what, you're in charge of a portion of the English Navy, because at this point, obviously, being parliamentarian, it wasn't the Royal Navy. And most people would basically roll over and fail horribly. Blake instead took to the task with gusto and proved to be a remarkably good admiral. And not only was he a remarkably good admiral, and you know, turning it around from a land based career to a sea based career at the highest levels like that is notable in and of itself. But also, Blake is credited, at least by some historians, with being one of the fulcrum admirals of the Royal Navy. So the Royal Navy, whether it started with Alfred the Great or Henry VIII, whichever you want, but 
the Royal Navy, by the time of the English Civil War, was still the Royal Fleet. It had a number of successes to its name, like the Spanish Armada. It had a number of fairly significant embarrassments and defeats to its name, like the English Armada. But ultimately, it was still a personal tool to be wielded by the Sovereign, who had just had his head cut off, and varied in strength and character depending on the whims of individual monarchs. Blake took that force and remoulded it into a much larger, much more powerful, much more effective, and honestly much better trained force. It became now an instrument of state with a relatively consistent, for the rest of its history, strength relative to the state's overall economic strength in the world. And so essentially turned it into a fully professionalised fighting force, not entirely detached from whoever was head of state at the time, and obviously in the aftermath of the English Civil War and our brief uh, flirtation with being a republic or a commonwealth, it went back to being the Royal Navy, but the Royal Navy that was left by Blake's passing was pretty much the foundational organisation that would become the Royal Navy of the classic Age of Sail. So, you know, much like Nelson sort of managed to turn the Royal Navy from the world's largest navy, but one that was fighting tooth and nail for dominance for decades into the navy that dominated the planet for the next century, Blake turned the Royal Navy, or as I said at his point, the English Navy, from a force that could punch above its weight, but was still somewhat limited to a relatively global organisation that could and did go out and find people across the planet and shoot them and then steal all their gold which usually they'd stolen from other people and redistribute it to still others. Nathapon Hong Sharon asks, one of the US Navy's brand new carriers seems to have or possibly had some difficulties with its toilet. Russia's last carrier built reportedly had the same issue. What are the design challenges of designing a this most crucial part of a warship throughout history, and what's its evolution? It's actually relatively simple. For the vast, 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 vast majority of the time, there wasn't one. Um, or more specifically, there was the ship's heads. Uh, that's the reason you look at the bow of Vasa. If you look very carefully, you can see what's left of the ship's heads. Called the head because, well, it's at the head of the ship, basically, in its crudest form, a bench with some holes in it that you could sit on and do your business, and hope the ship didn't plunge into the bow first into the sea while you were there. And if you were really lucky and you were an officer, you might have an equivalent private cubicle at the back of the ship. Um, or you might have a chamber pot, which then someone was going to have to deal with, which would be not particularly pleasant, but there you go. Because you've got to bear in mind, flushing toilets, which is what you need aboard a ship, are a mid-19th century invention. And it took a while for that to transpose itself into warships, albeit not tremendously long. Now, aboard a surface warship, it's not that difficult to give, get yourself a working toilet. Now, you do have to contend with some issues that land-based toilets don't have to, like pitching and rolling and so forth. So... You know, you don't necessarily want uh, water to be sloshing up and over all over the place um, when you're just not using it, or worse still, if you are. But the fundamental idea of some kind of contained, higher mounted gravity fed system, whether that be just, you know, gravity dropping the water or some kind of pump to flush away the waste and the waste then going down either to a storage tank or straight out the ship. That was, relatively speaking, easy to figure out. You see a similar, if not entirely, cloned system in use aboard aircraft these days. Um, so that's not tremendously difficult. They tend to use uh, valves and pumps rather than the gravity that you get in uh, on land, purely because it means that the system can A, work, as I said, while the ship is rolling, and B, it means you don't have to have standing water in 
most of the uh, basins. Once you get onto submarines, however, it becomes a lot more difficult because even with pumps and pressure, etc., etc., if the submarine is any substantial degree below the surface, there's going to be more pressure outside than there is inside, and if you try and flush a toilet to the outside of a submarine, and submarines have very limited space, so they're not really going to have much, if anything, in the way of storage tanks, you're just going to get a bunch of seawater coming back in, which is not good for a submarine, which is supposed to keep water on the outside. And so various nations concocted a number of different systems which kind of trade between complexity and thus in theory if operated safely safety versus somewhat less complex but perhaps slightly more dangerous systems now of course the danger could be either way if you make a system that's a little bit too simple then you could end up with something coming back but equally, if you make it far too complex, you'll end up with the same thing because people don't necessarily comprehend all the steps in which particular order you have to do them. In very crude terms, if you're going to have a toilet at sea in a submarine, you have to have some way of evacuating the waste away from the heads themselves, so away from the, the basin, if you like, and flushing that basin out, ideally with a relatively minimal amount of water then that has to be sealed away as a in a pressure sealed compartment you ideally don't want to then vent that directly to the sea because well then you've only got whatever you're using as a move, movable seal for the base of the basin to <laughs> prevent the sea coming in so you then need to try and shuffle this collection of waste out to a secondary system kind of like an airlock if you like and then from there, you can jettison it out to sea, basically using increasing amounts of pressure. You can use fairly standard pressure to evacuate the basin. You can then use maybe a slightly higher amount of pressure to get it into a, a temporary tank or something like that. And then once that is sealed, using proper you know, pipework seals, then you can see about pressurizing that enough to eject it all out into the ocean. And, well you've then got to find some way of whoever's sitting on the heads to be able to manipulate it all. So it, it's quite difficult. HMS Etc. asks, We often hear about pre dreadnoughts bristling with secondary, tertiary and quaternary and even quintenary batteries designed for, among other things, anti-torpedo boat defence. What was so dangerous about these torpedo boats? More specifically, what was the actual threat of these torpedo boats? Were there any incidents involving a successful or attempted torpedo boat attack? The dangerous thing about torpedo boats was that they could potentially sink an incredibly expensive battleship with a lot of men in it that was you know, something that would take years and years to replace with a relatively cheap, relatively expendable weapon. That was the, the single biggest threat, you know, compared to today. I mean, cost-wise... A supersonic or hypersonic anti-shipping missile would be about the same level of threat except that when the torpedo boat deployed you'd be looking at you know the equivalent period of say the 60s early 70s where you've got big incoming very fast anti-shipping missiles and not a huge amount that can stop them if they're coming in at a sea skimming level to be perfectly honest and then obviously as you get into the late 70s and early 80s you get CRWS and other point defence systems. Likewise, in the pre-dreadnought era, the secondary batteries of pre-dreadnoughts could in theory take out torpedo boats, but the very earliest secondary batteries on the later ironclads and early pre-dreadnoughts were initially relatively slow firing. They were quicker than the main guns, but that wasn't saying all that much. And the secondaries were designed primarily to engage other capital ships. And then, you know, because they had at least some rate of fire, they became vaguely useful against torpedo boats, better than nothing. But they needed faster tracking, faster firing weapons. And so you started to see 3-inch, 4-inch and guns, you know, 12-pounders, and then various autocannon of various descriptions in an attempt to get as much firepower out there as quickly as possible to try and disable the torpedo boats. 
because, well, accuracy was never going to be a particularly uh, high bar to clear, even at the relatively close range that early torpedo boats had to get. So rather than try and go for slightly expanding the secondary batteries, even once quick firing technology came in, it was more a case of throw as much steel, lead and high explosive downrange as possible and hopefully some of it will hit. In terms of successful torpedo boat attacks, I suppose it depends how you define the torpedo boat because you've got the spar torpedo boats, both surface and subsurface in the American Civil War, but if you want to look at relatively fast small surface craft that are launching self-propelled torpedoes, I think the first major ship that actually gets sunk by them is in the Chilean Civil War of 1891, which, as the name suggests, is part of the Chilean Navy attacking other parts of the Chilean Navy, and an ironclad frigate gets sunk by a couple of torpedo boats. You then have the Sino-Japanese War 1890s edition, where the Chinese lose three or four ships, depending on how you count it. Essentially, the ironclad Ding Yuen is the slightly sort of did they or did they not lose it to a torpedo boat one because it was hit, it was flooded, it ended up beaching itself to stop itself sinking, so you could count it as sunk. But kind of like with not Sadlitz so much because Sadlitz did make it back to port, Ding Yuen was just kind of stuck on a sandbar, but they did eventually patch it up enough to claim they they to then scuttled it themselves. That's at the Battle of Wei Hai Wei. So you're up to about four or five vessels sunk by torpedo boats. And well, the thing is, <laughs> during this entire period, there's not that from the introduction of what you might term proper torpedo boats. There's not actually that many major wars. Um, you've got the Spanish-American War. As far as I'm aware, in the big battles, at least, no one hit anyone with torpedoes from torpedo boats and sank anything. Then you've got the Russo-Japanese War, another half dozen-ish ships were hit and sunk by torpedoes from torpedo boats. Again, I say ish because some ships were already quite badly shot up and then finished off by torpedo boats. So whether you count them as sunk by torpedo boats or just, you know, torpedo boats get an kill assist, who knows. And then once you get much past that you're into the realm of torpedo boat destroyers and destroyers. Now obviously there will be further in reinventions of the torpedo boat, the coastal motor boat for example, in the which the Royal Navy uses against the Bolshevik fleet in the Baltic in 1919-1920. But if you want to look at the classic torpedo boat era, the thing that spawned the pre-dreadnought multiplicity of guns, there's a round of about a dozen kills to their name, give or take a little bit. Nick Brodar asks, The movie Greyhound shows a point-blank gun battle between the US destroyer in question and a surfaced U-boat. Did anything like this actually happen? Yes, actually. In World War One and World War II, there were quite a number of close-range gunfights between various escorts and the submarines that they were trying to get rid of. That ranged from, you know, over in the Pacific, where a pair of New Zealand escort ships that were actually outmassed by the Japanese sub they were fighting ended up in a close-range surface action. You have, of course, the famous USS O'Bannon potato incident, various ramming and gunfire attempts. It's, you know, it's not an everyday occurrence, but when a submarine is forced to the surface, or is caught on the surface... The escorts obviously try and get as close as humanly possible, because if they're further away, the U-boat can launch a torpedo at them, or the Japanese sub, whatever. And so it's a good idea just to get close. And also, if you get close, it means if the submarine dives, you're in a perfect position to start dropping depth charges on it. Except, of course, the U-boat has a deck gun, or two, or four. And so you end up in running gunfights more often than not with... Quite often, actually, the main objective of the escort being to keep the submarine crew from getting to their deck guns, because sometimes the escorts are not particularly heavily armed, and there is a possibility that a large submarine with a decent deck gun payload might actually win the gunfight if they let the U-boat crew or Japanese sub crew or whatever get to their guns. So, yeah, it happens quite often. Um, one example, you the reason I put this cover up, is there's a newly released book for, uh, via USNI Press, US Naval Institute Press, by the author David Sears, who I was lucky enough to meet and chat to while I was at the Historical Naval Ships Association conference at the time this video was going out 
week before the one that's just passed. And this is an entire book dedicated pretty much to exactly what you're asking about. And this is a fight as shown on the cover between the USS Bory and a German U-boat. So, yeah, have a look at that. Check it out if you like. I've got a copy. In fact, I actually have two copies. So, you know, if somebody wants a copy, maybe I should run a little giveaway or something. But in any case, very good book. Definitely worth reading, as are the other books by David Sears. And of course, obligatory plug, if you do choose to buy anything from USNI, there's a code down there in the video description which will get you money off. Todd Webb asks, if Rodney had a catastrophic engine failure whilst running at flank speed to get to Bismarck and was thus an engineering casualty, would the Royal Navy have sent in King George V alone, waited for another battleship to get there, or sent Swordfish at Bismarck indefinitely? If Rodney's out of action, the biggest constraint on the Royal Navy at this point is going to be fuel. They do not have enough fuel to stick around for too long, and also, you know, Bismarck only needs to get a relatively short distance to be under Luftwaffe air cover, and the longer the Royal Navy hangs around, the greater the chances of a U-boat or something similar showing up also becomes. So, if they, Rodney is not available, then looking at the forces that the Royal Navy does have available in the air, they've got a few destroyers, they've got some heavy cruisers, they've obviously got King George V, they also have Renown and Ark Royal. Now, historically speaking, the Ark Royal did actually send off a strike of swordfish, but they were told to go away by the battleships who were happily pummeling, pummeling Bismarck. So I think in this scenario, you would have Ark Royal ordered to launch an airstrike as soon as humanly possible in the morning. So you'd have a bunch of additional swordfish going in after a ship that essentially can't really dodge. So she'd take a bunch more hit torpedo hits from the swordfish. Renown also was permitted to engage Bismarck, but due to her thin armour, she was ordered only to engage Bismarck if Bismarck was already being heavily engaged by another capital unit. And Renown is not that far away, because she's with Sheffield and Ark Royal. So I think in a scenario where Rodney isn't available, you would have opened the morning with a mass strike by Ark Royal Swordfish, then you probably would have seen King George V move in with the two heavy cruisers forming a pincer. So you'd have two heavy cruisers and maybe some destroyers coming down one side, probably hanging back slightly to get King George V to draw the attention of Bismarck, and then obviously catching it in pincer fire. And Renown would probably be hovering just off the horizon as well, so you might actually end up with a three-way maneuver where after being destabilized by further swordfish torpedo hits bismarck sees king george v coming in with smoke circling around on the horizon obviously king george v is the biggest and most proximate threat so she engages king george v they start shooting at each other and as soon as tovi confirms yep bismarck is engaging king george v then you'd have all the other units swarm in from the other directions and so you'd have 15 inch 8 inch 4.7 inch and 14 inch and 5.25 inch and 4.5 inch shells all being hammered at Bismarck. So it probably goes vaguely similar to how it did with Rodney uh, taking on Bismarck, with the exception that obviously with additional aerial torpedo hits in her, Bismarck may well be wallowing, listing or capsizing even sooner than she did historically. If the gods wanted us to be happy, they would have given us a honey-based alcoholic beverage. Oh look, Mead asks... Can you tell us a bit about the why and the how of the Royal Navy's 1807 attack on Copenhagen? So, the 1807 attack on Copenhagen essentially was prompted by broadly the same worries that had prompted Nelson's earlier attack. Back then, that had been the League of Armed Neutrality. By 1807, the British were worried that Denmark, which at this point, remember, was considering more extensive than just the Danish peninsula, um, extending further north into what's now Norway, could, like she could have done six years earlier, cut British access to supplies in the Baltic, particularly with Sweden. Now, the reason why this was suddenly a concern once again was because Napoleon, at least the British believed, 
was in the process of either preparing to force Denmark via diplomatic pressure to join him and thus add the Danish fleet, which was a fairly nice little battle fleet in and of itself, to the French strength, as well as obviously closing off British access to the Baltic. Or, if the Danes refused him, he was just going to march in and invade anyway, and no one particularly rated the Danish army's chances against Napoleon in the latter part of the 1800s. So, as far as the British were concerned, by hook or by crook, the French were going to try and force the Danes into joining the war on the French side. Since the British didn't want to be cut off from the Baltic, they decided, well, the we only have two choices at this point. Either we force the Danes to join on our side instead, because at this point neutrality wasn't going to be an option anymore, or if we can't force them to join us, then we need to take the things that they might be able to use to threaten us, i.e. the Danish fleet, because the Danish army added to the French army is all well and good, but since Trafalgar there was no chance of any of substantial Napoleonic forces being sent over to Britain, so Napoleon could have as big an army as he liked as long as he didn't control the seas. At which point, the British sent a fleet to Copenhagen and basically said to the Danes, hey look, we know that the French are, or we suspect the French are trying to pressure you into joining the war against us. You essentially need to either join the war against the French, or you need to surrender your fleet to us so that you can't use it against us. And to a certain extent, the British were right. The French were about to either threaten... Well, they had. They were already threatening the Danes, and they were amassing forces to try and invade Denmark as well. So they were, they were kind of right that, that that was was about to go down. The Danes, of course, turned around and said, you can't have our ships, at which point the British said, well, either you let us have the ships or we blow you up and take them ourselves. The Danes said, try it. The British said, OK, we will, and started shooting up Copenhagen, having used their fleet to cut off the Danish army from being able to come back to defend it. They then bombarded the city for several days, and eventually the damage and casualties got high enough that the Danes basically put up their hands and said, OK, fine, you can take the fleet, just you know, stop blowing up the capital, which, to be fair, got the British quite a lot of stick internationally. The British then took the fleet, integrated some of it into the Royal Navy, uh, used the rest as store ships, hulks, etc., etc., and essentially withdrew happy in the knowledge that they had the Danish fleet under their command and the Danes couldn't do anything to cut off British trade to the Baltic. Except, of course, they just royally ticked off the Danes, who promptly joined Napoleon in uh, alliance against the British, which was exactly what the British had theoretically been trying to prevent, and then you've got a whole gunboat war, which I've mentioned in previous Trydocs, which, whilst very annoying and diverting a fair amount of British resources to try and deal with, was still substantially less threatening than the original potential, which would have been for you know a bunch of heavy third rates cruising around, which would have required significantly more uh, resources to try and see off. The Almighty Hypnotoad asks, How long did it take for the Royal Navy to establish a permanent presence in the Americas, and what were the greatest challenges in doing so? So, depending on how you define the Americas, if you in define the Americas as basically any landmass, North, South, Central America, Caribbean, then the first permanent Royal Navy presence in the Americas would be the Jamaica Station, formed in 1655, um, and that was mostly aimed at deterring dash taking colonies away from the Spanish in the Caribbean. Its largest threat, as was the threat to pretty much all Royal Navy ships operating in the Caribbean, was tropical disease, uh, which killed far, 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 far more many, um, that's a ridiculous turn of phrase, far more Royal Navy personnel than enemy action ever did. But they didn't really have much of a choice because that's where the major threat was, so that's where they had to station the ships. Subsequent to that, in terms of permanent stations, in the 1740s you have the formation of the North America Station, as it would later become known, um, or alternatively the Halifax Station. This was the first 
placement of Royal Navy ships in a permanent station on the American continent itself, as opposed to on an island in the Caribbean. And then that was expanded out to Bermuda, and there was also going to be, well, there were some semi-permanent Royal Navy formations in various American ports, but the American War of Independence came along, and so there was never any such thing as you know, a Royal Navy fleet permanently based out of Boston or anywhere like that. And the North America Station, and which eventually became the North American West Indies Station when it absorbed Jamaica, for a long time was Halifax and Bermuda, keeping an eye on the nascent United States. Tug Trash 88 asks, How realistic are the naval tactics in the movie Han San Rising Dragon? Nationalist propaganda and dramatic licenses aside, medieval rowing ships going 40 knots, really? Specifically, is there any historical evidence to the Wall of the Sea manoeuvre being real? I just don't see those rather square rowing vessels being handy enough to perform the pivoting manoeuvre in formation as shown in the movie. And even if they could, wouldn't they have just formed line like traditional ships? Now, as I've said before, one of the reasons I haven't done a video on Admiral Yi yet is that I am still making efforts to find out as much as I can about him and Korean ancient naval tactics because, well, they are completely different as well. well Japanese, Chinese, Korean, you know, all their ancient naval tactics are completely different to Western European naval tactics. And I need to have a fairly broad range of sources before I'm confident to speak to any great effect on them. However, looking at things from a purely, if you like, practical perspective, aside from the question of whether or not these specific tactics were used in this specific battle, which is, I don't know yet, um, the types of ships that you see being used are actually, relatively speaking, well suited for this purpose. They're not going to be particularly fast. You know, the, the hyper rowboat speeds that are shown in the movie, essentially, I think, to compress the battle down from, you know, a whole day or more to something they can actually show in a few minutes. But yeah, they're, they're not particularly fast ships, but they're all, almost not quite, but almost barge-like. And of course, they have lots of rowers on both sides. Now, that actually means... Pivoting in place is much, much easier for this kind of ship than it would be for a contemporary Western European vessel. Of course, that there is still about a bit of mass to overcome, so you wouldn't want to be pivoting at speed in this kind of formation. If you wanted to keep your formation, you would have to slow down, and then everybody could pivot in place. And of course, if you have everybody advancing line abreast in this kind of crescent and then everybody rotates in place to present their guns, that is going to require either a huge amount of fine control and coordination, which frankly didn't exist at the time, or it's going to require you to have pre-planned everything, which I think the movie shows they actually are doing, and have some way of actually you know, telling everybody fairly simply, you know, time to execute the plan. Otherwise, you end up with some ships continuing to go forward, other ships stopping too early, ships not beginning their rotations in time, etc., etc. It's not an impossible situation to overcome because single-use signals at a technological level like this are not out entirely out of the question. Trumpets at this range yelling, you know, passing the word, flags, cannon shot, etc., all potentially usable. So... Whilst at the speed that it's depicted, no, obviously not realistic. In more general terms, the idea of could we advance a fleet in line abreast to block a channel and then have them rotate in place to present broadside. For these kind of ships, actually, yeah, you, you probably could do that. And in terms of forming a line of battle, well, not really, because as I say, they're not particularly fast they're not particularly agile and i believe if i recall correctly the point of this battle was to stop the japanese advancing if you form a long 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 line of battle when ships are at the numbers like this then your lead elements are just going to get mobbed and the enemy fleet can bypass you if they want so uh, you know advancing the line abreast is the best way to get your fleet to the fight then 
putting yourselves in a line of battle is the best way to present them broadside, which is technically actually what they're doing in this case. It's just that their line of battle is a big curve. Ash, the Lego guy, asks, Did any Navy ever attempt to try to reduce or conceal wake for any sized vessel in the time before non-optical detection technology? This includes anything tried to, re tried to reduce the wake or spray caused by periscopes of otherwise submerged submarines. For submarines, yes, there definitely were attempts to reduce the wake or feather caused by periscopes. This consisted of generally making better optics for periscopes so you can make the periscope itself narrower and also shaping the outer periscope tube so it didn't throw up quite as much water because obviously the periscope was the best way for the sub to observe the outside world without being detected and that's not going to help if there's you know a massive rooster trail of water coming off it. Plus there's obviously the more mundane thing of just slow down and you'll generate hopefully somewhat less of a wake from your periscope. But in terms of reducing or concealing the wake of a ship on the surface during the time period the channel covers, there were a few minor experiments here and there, but nothing of any particularly great note. And that's simply because a lot of wake reduction is actually quite convergent with the design of ships because if you have a big frothing visible wake that's lost energy and so yeah that's energy that's not propelling your ship forward it's just churning the water up on the water air interface and you don't want that so ideally for a more efficient ship for better speed and better fuel economy you want a ship that doesn't generate too much of a visible foamy wake anyway so a lot of what we might consider to be weight reduction measures or weight reduction measures would have been not consciously thought about but incorporated into the hydrodynamics of hull design. Now there were various you know, short-term measures that could be used to reduce your wake if you absolutely had to. Um, putting out oil was a way that you know, jettisoning some of your fuel oil was seen as a way of calming the water a little bit which would help you reduce your wake either for stealth purposes in extremists and sometimes just to calm the water to allow a seaplane to land or something like that. But as I said, outside of a few experiments here and there, which didn't really see huge amounts of widespread uptake before the advent of radar and so forth, it, and well, acoustic torpedoes and such like, there just wasn't enough of a drive to separately try and reduce wake independent of general hydrodynamics. How many Blackburn Blackburns could a Blackburn Blackburn burn if a Blackburn Blackburn could burn Blackburn Blackburns, asks. I was wondering, in the case of small sailboats or ships that replicate larger ships sail rigging, like that of a bark or a fully rigged ship, how the scaled down size affects the sailing characteristics and how they handle the wind, such as the case of the Maryland Federalist, the Grand Vasso of Versailles, and the even smaller scale replicas such as remote control sailboats. It is something of a negative effect because the linear square cube law in this case is working against you. Bearing in mind that obviously the larger ships will have multiple sails at the dimensions in terms of ratio and everything that they do, in part because of the physical limitations of canvas and wood and rope at that scale when you're talking about the full scale ships. Once you get down to something like these scale models, they really don't have to worry all that much. I mean, you can see on this, this is the Maryland Federalist. There's just not a huge amount of rigging in and of itself, you know, the lines and everything, because it's not necessary. Those masts could almost be freestanding in and of themselves, as opposed to the much larger masts on something like Constitution. And so there is no need for these relatively small sail areas, and thus you're not going to be moving at any particularly great rate. That's why, you know, if you look at a 15-foot sailboat that's actually planned to scale as a 15-foot sailboat, as opposed to this 15-foot replica, a 15-foot sailboat will tend to usually have just the one mast, but the overall sail area of that mast would be considerably more than, than this little model. For reference, the Constitution, 
is just under 12 times the length at Waterline as the Maryland Federalist, but it has over 320 times the sail area. Again, this is being obviously because as you scale down the dimensions of a ship linearly, um, then, well, sail area is an area, so it's length multiplied by breadth, so you're reducing the sail area by the square as you reduce the ship in scale terms by the linear meter or the linear foot. So if you want to compare you know, sail plan, sail area to length ratio or displacement ratio or whatever, a full-size ship is going to be massively more efficient in this respect. Also, if you're using you know, proper materials like sail canvas as opposed to light cotton cloth or something, then you're also going to find the sails are proportionally significantly heavier at this scale than they would be on a full-size ship. Dax Surf asks, considering how long a time period capital ships were fitted with torpedo launchers, how often did capital ships actually use torpedoes in battle? Well, compared to previous periods, the period when battleships actually carried torpedo tubes saw relatively few wars. Now, granted, that does include things like World War One, which is fairly major, saw a lot of different engagements, but not a huge number of battleship or battleship engagements. But the opportunities for enemy capital ships, whether they be ironclads, pre-dreadnoughts or dreadnoughts, to confront each other during the period when those ships were carrying their own torpedo tubes was relatively reduced compared to, say, the Napoleonic Wars or something like that. Nonetheless, in the earlier clashes between ironclads and pre-dreadnoughts, there was a reasonable amount of torpedo use, nothing with any actual success, but bearing in mind we're talking up to kind of just before Tsushima when people are potting away at each other at 1,000, 1,500 yards. Well, that's not exactly particularly surprising. They're going to be lobbing torpedoes at each other because the torpedo is well in range, and you might as well. It turns out, as I said, it didn't actually hit anything, but never mind. Why? By the time you get to the Battle of Jutland, every capital ship there is carrying torpedoes. A few torpedoes are fired by the capital ships on either side, Again, not scoring any hits, but proportionally, once you get past Tsushima and the Russo-Japanese War in general, you're entering a period of ranges getting longer and longer and longer and longer, at which point, if a battleship finds itself, certainly in World War I, within torpedo range of another battleship on the other side, something has gone horrifically wrong. Uh, at which point, whether or not you're going to launch a torpedo at each other is probably the least of your worries. And then, of course, you get into World War II, and whilst some torpedoes, like the long ones, have massively upgraded their range, by and large, battleship engagements are going to be taking place at a range of well beyond your ability to actually torpedo anything. And so the usage of torpedoes drops off quite dramatically, with, of course, there being a couple of notable exceptions, like Rodney versus Bismarck, albeit that's largely because Rodney is closing in to very, very short ranges compared to what Doctrine of the Time suggested a normal engagement would be fought at. Jeffrey Connolly asks, The sloop of war USS Saratoga. Not much from what I can find is known of her disappearance. What do you believe happened, and is there any other source that I could check to look into this vessel, since there doesn't seem to be very much on her? Well, Naval History and Heritage Command has a rather nice entry on her. It's a good little summary of her career. Now, in terms of what I believe happened to her, well, as you say, there's not a huge amount written. Her wreck hasn't been found, etc. But there are, I think, some circumstantial clues. So, she did have a little bit of damage and slightly fewer crew than would be ideal because she just put off a prize crew and she had been engaged in a running gun fight that was quite vicious a little time before she was lost. That in and of itself I don't necessarily think has a huge impact on her loss but maybe could have been a tipping factor if there was one. Just something to bear in mind. Now of course Saratoga was sailing with a a convoy made up of merchant ships, Continental Navy ships, and French ships, because of course this was the time of the American War of Independence, so she was part of the Continental Navy, 
and she'd gone off after a couple of prizes, taken one, as said, gone off after the other. And all we know by that point is that the prize that she'd already taken, which was heading back for the convoy, was suddenly overtaken by an incredibly vicious rise in the wind, which almost capsized the prize. They obviously fought to try and keep her upright, which they succeeded in doing. By the time they overcame that, the wind died down, they looked around, Saratoga had, was nowhere to be seen. Now, I don't know what, if anything, is known of the second ship that she happened to be chasing. You know, Did that make it out of there? Did that disappear as well? I couldn't find any particular information one way or the other. But from the description, you would initially think maybe it's a squall. Because, you know, squalls can move in at very high speed. They can suddenly bring massive gusts of wind and they can be very threatening to a ship. However, there is one downside to this, which is that squalls are fairly well known at sea. Now, yes, squalls do still take ships in this time period, regardless of how well known they are. But squalls are generally also accompanied by clouds, rain, etc., etc., and what accounts survive don't seem to indicate that this happened. You know, if they were overtaken by a sudden violent squall, they would have said so. Instead, uh, they just say that they were caught, caught up with the wind suddenly rising to a fearful velocity. Now, there is a phenomena which you really do not want to get caught in if you're at sea, which is commonly called a white squall. Now, obviously, a normal squall, as I said, accompanied by clouds and rain and all sorts, White squalls are so-called because they don't seem to be accompanied by anything other than absolutely ferocious winds that whip up the sea surface and obviously cause breaking waves, the white referencing the wave caps. It's been suggested that perhaps a white squall is maybe associated with microbursts, which those of you familiar with aircraft will no, uh, incredibly violent downdrafts of wind that can knock planes out of the sky if they're not careful. And white squalls, microbursts, whatever you want to call them, they are known to have claimed ships very violently and very quickly in a number of different instances. Uh, for example, um, one was described as a tremendous whistling sound suddenly roaring through the rigging and a wall of wind hit us in the back. The ship heeled over in a matter of seconds and a 70 knot wind, i.e., you know, 100 kilometers an hour, 1900 miles an hour, pushed a 20 foot high wall of water into the starboard side. The ship sank in minutes. So, given that the prize was hit by something that was incredibly violent and almost capsized them, I would suggest that this sort of white school microburst phenomena may have come down with poor old Saratoga at the center of it and the prize at the very edge of it, and Saratoga, with all sails set, ready to go after the second prize, would have been very vulnerable, probably just blown clean over on her side, and much like the Mary Rose, sank without a trace in a matter of minutes. Which is very tragic, but, you know, unfortunately that's the way of the sea. Robert Hilton asks, For the pre-revolution French Royal Navy, how were the officers generally trained for command? Could you purchase and enter an advanced rank based on social class? Did they draw from a similar or smaller pool of their populace compared to the British Royal Navy? Theoretically, with their much larger population, the French had a much larger pool of people to draw on for their officers. But in practice, as I've mentioned in other dry docks and in this one, the French could afford to spend proportionally less on their navy because they needed a proportionally larger army. So that pool where they might be drawing officers from would more often draw people off to the army or admin than it would to the navy. Now, in terms of the training, etc., for the French navy in the classic Age of Sail, it's a huge topic that people have written entire thesis about it. Um, so I'm going to try and summarise it in a few minutes. Essentially, the French started out in the mid-1600s in a very strong position indeed. Uh, they actually opened the officer corps up to considerably wider levels of social class than the British or English at the time did. And they provided a fairly comprehensive technical education on the basis that 
officers who understood how their ships were put together would be able to operate their ships better. Um, so they were taking more of an engineering focused approach, m more modern times that we've seen with uh, how Admiral Rickover redid US Navy officer training. Um, whereas in the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy, that is, um, both then and now, it's been more about leadership skills and the technical side of working the ship. Well, if you work it out yourself, you, that's great. But that's what the master of the ship is for, <laughs> for the most part. There are strengths and weaknesses to both approaches. But in any case, you had this highly technical, um, very skilled French officer corps going into the last part of the 17th and then into the early 18th centuries. And they were doing quite well for themselves, you know, very socially broad, very um, well-educated, the envy of the world in many cases. And then things started to go wrong. Um, there were occasional attempts to fight back against the things that went wrong, um, but very often the attempts ended up doubling down and making things even worse, as it turned out. And essentially what happened were two things. Firstly, there was a officer corps within an officer corps. So the aristocratic, especially the very high-born aristocratic officers, kind of formed their own little clique called the Grand Corps within the seagoing officers. And entry to that was limited by a slew of factors. And to be fair, you did have to actually prove that you knew what you're talking about in terms of your technical education. But you also had to prove both a noble pedigree and a seagoing command pedigree to enter. And of course, as with any kind of exclusive clique within an officer corps, they very rapidly became dominant. The other problem was that the French Navy had divided its officer corps into two separate officer corps, not including the unofficial uh, nobility-dominated internal corps. And the two official divisions were Broadly speaking, officer, I think the translation is officers of the pen and officers of the sword. The officers of the pen were bureaucrats, administrators, people who ran shipyards, etc. The officers of the sword, as the name might suggest, were in charge of actually you know, taking ships out to sea and fighting people with them. The problem then was that the to become an officer of the pen, you didn't actually strictly need to know anything about ships, shipping, or the navy in terms of you know naval logistics and everything. And because you were permanently ashore and much closer to the centres of power, and the officers of the sword were very often out of communication for months at a time, taking fleets across the world, it was much, much easier for the officers of the pen to take over more and more and more of the bureaucracy and to influence people at court in their favour and you know, to the disfavour of the officers of the sword because they couldn't do anything to reply until they came back, by which point it was could be pretty much fait accompli. And so you had this growing body of officers of the pen gradually subsuming more and more of the key elements of the French Royal Navy. And a lot of them had no real idea about what a navy was. It was more of a vehicle for social and monetary advancement for themselves. There were, as I said, attempts to reform this, but the Grand Corps within the Officers of the Sword essentially just decided instead of trying to take on the Officers of the Pen, who were, after all, quite a lot of them, their own aristocratic peers, they decided actually the problem was too many commoners, too many low-ranked gentry, too many merchant ship captains in their um, officer group. And so the French officer corps gradually began to close up more and more to outside influence from outside the nobility, which was had been one of its greatest strengths. And as, now, as I said, they did try and push back against this occasionally from on high, but it never really stuck. And so you ended up by the latter part of the 18th century with admittedly very well educated but very very aristocratic officers with a huge amount of essentially naval ignorant bureaucrats dominating the overall officer corps and a small very insular actual seagoing officer corps and then, of course, the French Revolution came along and ch chopped off the heads of almost everybody who was nobility, which decapitated the what had been the Marine Royale, now the Marine Nationales, 
ability to command at sea. And, you know, if the French Revolution had happened a century or so earlier, it wouldn't have had anywhere near as much of an impact because back then the French officer corps was actually far more egalitarian. That is the very, very short form, um, even though this answer has gone on for quite a bit. But in terms of could you purchase or enter in an advanced rank, you couldn't bypass the tests that you needed to get to, uh, get through to get a foot in the door, as it were. But your wealth and aristocratic pedigree would allow you to advance into this Grand Corps and to the upper echelons of command towards the latter part of the Age of Sail far more easily than a meritocratic advancement could be done. Albeit that, ironically enough, some of the earliest French admirals were what you might call low-born people who descended all the way up. But, as I mentioned, that was kind of the mid-17th century to the early 18th century. By the time you get well into the 18th century, they're really, really, really gone full in for the we are nobles and officers and the two are inextricably linked. HMS Inconceivable asks, sometimes mid-battle damage reports say there's flooding in compartment X, and sometimes there's flooding between frames X and Y, and other times they say there's flooding in a general area like the starboard wing turret. What do numbered frames and compartments mean, and is there a hierarchy in these three methods when reporting damage? So apologies for the extreme zoom in, but I think this is the only way you're going to be able to read at least some of it. Ostensibly, there will be different hierarchies within different navies as to what you should report, but in practice, people report what is most likely to be best understood. So, flooding in compartment X. So, all compartments will have designated references, and quite often, those compartments will have the number or and letter, i.e. the alphanumerical values, will actually translate to tell you roughly where on the ship that compartment is. Now, of course, exactly what those values are and how long they are and what determines where they are, that varies from Navy to Navy and from era to era. So if you see Battleship New Jersey's channel, uh, Ryan will walk on one of his videos, will actually walk you through these rather complex alphanumeric codes you'll find scattered around the New Jersey but once you understand what they mean, they actually tell you, you know, what side of the ship you're on, what deck you're on, and roughly where um, up and down the ship you are in terms of fore to aft. These are the zoomed in sections of a pair of diagrams of USS Texas. So some of the nomenclature is a little bit more basic. So you've got you know, boiler room B3. So flooding compartment B3 would be in the central boiler room in her refit version. Now, that obviously will tell you a specific compartment location. So that's quite useful for, say, a shell hole, something like that, a, a small area that might be flooded. Flooding between frames X and Y. Now, that is much more general because, as you can see here, the compartments are all of different sizes. And you can see along the bottom of each of the ship diagrams here a series of numbers. And that corresponds to the ship's frames, uh, which when you see a ship under construction, basically the bits that look like the ribs of a ship. If the if the ship's underlying structure is like a rib cage, these are the individual ribs. And of course, the frames are numbered from fore to aft. So if the captain knows that, say, there are, let's say, 150 frames on his ship, and someone says there's flooding between frames 10 and 15... And he knows that his the gap between each frame is, let's say for sake of argument, five feet. He can immediately go, okay, five frames, five feet. That's a 25-foot gash in the ship. That's pretty bad. we we'll probably do something about it. And also, obviously, tells him in that particular case that the uh, hole in the ship is near the bow. But obviously, frames without any further reference don't necessarily tell you where the hole is. So apart from the fore to aft reference. So a hole, let's say, again, between frames five, uh, let's say, I don't know, 30 and 33. Again, that's going to be relatively far forward. In the case of Texas here, uh, that would, between 30 and 33, would be essentially from about halfway down turret one to uh, 
midway between turret one and turret two. But that doesn't tell you, is this hole on the underside of the ship? Is it on the port side? Is it on the starboard side? You have to add an additional qualifier. Uh, I mean, if you don't have to add an additional qualifier, that usually means there's a really big hole. That's not good. Um, now, compartment numbers or frame numbers, if the person who's reporting knows what they are, are really good for pinpointing the area of where the damage is and how bad it might be. But sometimes, either through heat of the moment or just through whoever survived to report it, they might not necessarily know what these references are, at which point giving a general area, like, you know, port side abreast turret one, is the best that you're going to get and is still relatively informative in the more general sense. And also, you know, before damage control crews, etc., can work out exactly the extent of the damage, giving the captain an idea of roughly where the damage is, is also a good thing. So, you know, if you're, again, using the, this diagram of Texas as an example, if you were to say, you know, torpedo hit a breast frame 15, that's not good because that's the bow and that's well past most, if all not all, torpedo defense measures. Okay, there's not a huge amount that's vital that far forward on the ship but you're now plunging forward with the massive hole in the bow that could lead to a lot of flooding and you know there's going to likely be extensive damage because there was no torpedo defense there whereas if someone says uh you know torpedo hit a midship's uh, uh breast frame 80 well you don't want to be hit by a torpedo but you're going to have a little bit more faith that you know they've hit directly on the blisters it might not be quite as bad, although then you have to think, okay, but what's behind frame 80? In this case, if at least if you look at the lower of the two diagrams, frame 80 is the dynamo and rooms. So this could be a problem for your power supply. It's worryingly close to boiler room B4, but the immediate flooding might not be too bad as long as boiler room B4 hasn't been negatively affected by the blast. So that immediately tells you, right, I need to either contact the boiler room or send someone down to the boiler and make sure that large space is intact and maybe start thinking about how we're going to deal with potential power loss if the dynamo room is flooded. But of course, you know, the more information that you can give, the better. So if you combine it all together and you say, oh, you know, we've taken heavy shell damage abreast frame 40 starboard side storerooms flooded sir that tells you quite a lot about exactly what has happened and where on the ship of course assuming as we said earlier that both the reporter and the reportee know what exactly all that means bob hedges asks how is down flooding angle calculated is it based on the maximum load when the ship is deepest in the water or is there a table available for reference with draft versus down flooding angle and different trims available were warships designed to have the greatest possible down flooding angle, or were they just designed to maximize water tightness and take whatever down flooding angle resulted? The down flooding angle changes on a ship by ship basis and in a situation by situation basis. So there is no one down flooding angle for a given ship, because what the down flooding angle means in its most basic form is at what angle of heel i.e., you know, we take a line from the ship's center line on the water line and go, okay, if the ship starts to heel over, obviously normally the hull is watertight, but at some point you're going to end up with something that is not watertight through which water can flood and it will then flood down into what is the lower portions of the ship beneath it, which would otherwise have been watertight. Now, obviously, if your ship is lightly loaded compared to if your ship is heavily loaded, because you're going from the waterline angle at an angle of heel, your down flooding angle may be very different. So in a ship that's in its peacetime configuration, the down flooding angle may be controlled by things like ventilators uh, and their openings. Or if somebody's left a porthole open or something, hopefully they didn't do that. But once you get into battle damage, like, say, Sadlitz here, then your down flooding angle could radically change because 
it could now be dictated by a hole in the side of the hull, blown by a shell. Suddenly, now your down flooding angle is much, much smaller. Because, obviously, say with Sadlitz, you might, using arbitrary numbers, be able to roll over at 40 degrees when she's intact and no water will come onto the ship. And once she's been shot up by a bunch of ships at the Battle of Jutland, notwithstanding the torpedo holes in her, she might only have a day on flooding angle of 10 or 15 degrees because of holes inside of the hull, as I just said. So warships generally, obviously, they don't want to have water pouring down into the ship if they roll in bad weather. So warships normally would try for the greatest possible down flooding angle, i.e. they were being closed as high up in the ship as they could manage, but this is also why hatches in the decks have to be secured. That's why on warships they tend to sit somewhat proud of the deck, because you could have, you know, a really, really high, you could have a 50 degree down flooding angle, and then if someone pops a hole in the side of your hull 10 foot above the water line, yeah, all of that was pointless, because if water pours in through that hole and then floods down into your ship, you sink and die. Unless, of course, every single deck and every single hatch is watertight and, you know, has ideally this raised lip so that the lower portion of its down flooding, not flooding angle, it might hopefully still be sealed away, even if you do have a hole in the side of your ship 10 foot above the waterline. A particularly evil individual who goes by the name this week or month as His Norwegian Majesty's ship Schleswig Jaguiberi, I think, please have mercy, asks, If a non-human primate constructed a fishing raft but later chose to also use it to store and throw objects at rivals on the shoreline, would you still consider this a fishing vessel, a fishing vessel converted to a combat vessel, a combat vessel, some sort of multi-purpose vessel, or something else. Well, of course, first things first, you have to watch out for if the occupant of the raft is chanting apes together strong, or something similar to that. But, I mean, it was built with the intention of, from the question of being a fishing raft, so it is a fishing vessel to start with. If it is then converted to some form of combat, in this case as a muscle-powered artillery platform, that does not strictly make it a combat vessel. You know, you had trawlers in World War I and World War II that were given guns. They became armed trawlers, but they still remained trawlers. Um, they didn't become full-fledged warships, even if some of them might have received an HMS designation, because to be a warship requires a little bit more than just having a uh, abbreviation stuck on the front of your name. I would broadly point to, you know, what do we call things like medieval cogs? Because for the most part, they are merchant vessels, but they are also armed. They can be used as warships in times of need, and quite often they would go around with at least some warship fittings, even when they were ostensibly at peace because of things like pirates. Now, just because a cog has a forecastle and an aftercastle or a stern castle, as you can see here, and just because it carries armed men, that does not make it a combat vessel, strictly speaking, a warship, unless and until it is brought in exclusively or primarily for that purpose. The fact that it may be incidentally used as a combat vessel or a warship in specific circumstances doesn't change the fact it is still originally and primarily a trading vessel, and in the period when the line between merchant ship and warship is very blurred, we just tend to refer to them as ships. So in the case of this question, I would just class it as, you know, ape raft or something like that. Sea Dodders asks, some large caliber warship guns have flared muzzles. Why is this? Well, you can see here on this example of the 15 inch 42, there is just a little flare of the muzzle. This is basically to strengthen the gun to stop it splitting, because whilst the propellant is expanding down the barrel of the gun, of course there is pressure being exerted equally on all internal sides, and the cylinder 
roughly speaking, of the gun will resist the pressure all nicely. However, once the propellant reaches the end of the barrel, and obviously the shell ejects as, as well, you've got a lot of pressure, but instead of, if you take any particular cross-section through the gun, having that section of the gun supported both before and after the pressure spike by other parts of the gun, at the very end, whilst the pressure is exhausting and obviously decreasing, the very tip of the gun only has the bit of the gun that goes before it to support it. There is no support from further on because it's the end of the gun barrel. And of course, that flare of burning propellant is expanding around the tip, which is heating the tip, which is heating the depth of the gun barrel, i.e. from outer to inner layer, considerably more and considerably faster than would be done internally. And all of that adds up to essentially more pressure, less resistance in the material and more heat, which can lead to splits beginning at the end of the gun barrel. And that's not what you want because, well, at best, you're going to end up with a bananaed 15 inch gun barrel or whatever your caliber happens to be. Uh, the worst doesn't really bear thinking about. And so by introducing a little bit more material, i.e. creating this flare, because you can't narrow down the in internal part of the barrel, you end up making the muzzle of the barrel a little bit stronger than the rest of the gun barrel, and that means it's much better able to resist all those factors. As time goes on and metallurgy becomes better and better, the need for this goes away. Well, it doesn't go away entirely, but it, it falls within the parameters of the new materials the guns are made of. So if you wind the clock back another 20, 30 years to the late 19th century, you'll see that quite a lot of gun barrels have considerably more pronounced flare than this 15-inch gun does. And then you wind it forward a couple of decades to you know 16-inch and 15-inch guns being manufactured in the late 30s, and you'll see that few, if any, of them have any visible flare whatsoever. Jonathan Smith asks, infrastructure question, if in 1918 and a nation is constructing a dry dock that's able to handle their largest planned warship, what would the relative time and cost difference be between building a regular dry dock and a floating one? And are there any advantages to each approach? A floating dry dock is going to take longer to build. If you look at the large floating dry docks that were built in sections in World War II, and then you consider that you're looking at ships between 900 and 1,000 foot long at the end of 1918, if you include stuff like the early sketches for the Lexingtons or Fisher's Incomparable, etc. Given that it takes, on average, two years, and for some of the bigger ones, maybe even up to almost three in World War II, to construct all the sections, bring them together and form the dry dock and then commission it, if you're going to add a little bit more onto that still... I'd say you're looking at a solid two and a half to three years to construct, a, let's say, a thousand foot long floating dry dock that can handle a 50, 60, 70,000 ton ship. Whereas for a regular dry dock, you dig a big hole in the ground and then you line it with concrete or stone or whatever, your construction material of choices. The most complicated part of it is building the gates and keeping the thing dry while you're digging the big hole. And as you can see, when you look at the speed at which some of the dry docks were constructed at Pearl Harbor, you can build a land-based dry dock, as long as you have access to heavy construction equipment, within a year, sometimes within a few months. Well, not maybe a few months, but six to eight months, something like that. So the land-based dry dock is faster to build, but of course... There are advantages and disadvantages to both sides. The land-based dry dock, you need decent geology, which you might not have. You need enough space on land, and, well, shoreside space is usually at a premium. And, of course, it doesn't go anywhere, which is a little inconvenient at times. If it's in one of your major naval bases, then that could be really good. But if you have global ambitions, and let's use an incomparable, for example... It's all very well and good if you build a giant dry dock in, let's say, Portsmouth. I mean, you have to dredge the channel out as well for that, but never mind. Let's say it's in Portsmouth. 
but that means you probably also need a similar dry dock in Malta or Gibraltar, another one in Hong Kong or Singapore, maybe at the time Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. You might need one at Halifax. You know, So suddenly, while it's cheaper and quicker to build one very large land-based dry dock, if you're planning on your monster ship going all over the place, you might find yourself having to build half a dozen, which will escalate the costs rather quickly. Whereas with a floating dry dock, theoretically, it can, well, not necessarily follow the ship around, but it can be in multiple places over the course of various years. So you might build a single land-based dry dock in your home nation for regular servicing of your monster ship, and then it might actually be cheaper than building five others elsewhere to just build one or two of these big floating dry docks, which you can then take out to the most likely areas of operation. And if you're planning on changing those areas of operation, well, you can move the floating dry dock around, can't you? The disadvantages of the floating dry dock, of course, are that it can be sunk, it can collapse, it's a very complicated operation to raise and lower the thing, and it can be attacked by the enemy, and floating dry dock is a lot more vulnerable to damage than a regular dry dock, which usually, unless you do something like Campbelltown, is incredibly difficult to actually do much of anything to. But of course, the floating dry dock doesn't need to have pre-existing shoreside space. It can just sit out in the harbour if it needs to, doing whatever refit work it needs to do. So it the in essentially the initial startup costs and the vulnerability of a floating dry dock are worse, but its overall utility is better, even if it might need a little bit more skill to operate. Whereas fixed dry docks, the land-based ones, they are much cheaper to build, they're much lower maintenance, but they are limited by the fact that ships have to come to them rather than vice versa. And also in terms of expansion, if you build your floating dry dock with sufficient beam, then if somebody invents, say, an 1,100-foot ship, well, you can, in theory, assuming you kept all the drawings and made everything interchangeable, because these things are built in sections, you can just build another couple of sections and slap it onto your floating dry dock, and hey, now your floating dry dock can support your new bigger ship. Digging out and expanding a land-based dry dock is a considerably more fraught process, even assuming you have the space to do so. And that brings us to the end of part one of Dry Dock 266. Uh, well done for getting it this far. As you may have been able to hear through the recording of this, I have developed a something of a head cold. Um, which particular flight I caught it on, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. Hopefully I'll be over it soon, and we shall continue with more videos. Anyway, on to part two.